Yo, Atlas speaking and welcome to a brand new series on the channel. What if I was reborn into the Bleach universe and became the insane Vasto Lord? Synopsis, in a world where Kazuya felt trapped, he longed for a life of freedom. When he wakes up in this strange land of Hueco Mundo, he's determined to make the most of this new chance. But things won't be easy with the villainous Aizen Sosuke wanting to control Hueco Mundo for his own dark purposes. With powerful Vasto Lord class abilities and a strong system, Kazuya must find his way through the tough world of Bleach, making friends and fighting enemies to keep his freedom. As challenges rise and danger grows, can Kazuya's strong will and determination help him break free from control and come out on top? And with that being said, let the tale begin. Chapter 1 Hey You! A dark basement filled with a suffocating stench and less than a healthy percentage of oxygen content, it was the type of shady place every parent warned their children about. A place you should never visit after dark. Unfortunately, Kazuya found himself in this devious place, sitting on a rusty steel chair, hands cuffed behind him. A blonde man in a shiny suit seared down at him and raised a revolver in his hand. The cold barrel touched his forehead. A wave of chill passed over him as a droplet of sweat dripped down his cheeks, falling onto his messy white shirt. Kazuya, blame your hard-ass grandfather for prioritizing his job over your life, the Yakuza-like man said, his tone colder than Kazuya's terror but his eyes carried a faint look of pity. The sin for your death will be on his soul. He shifted the blame of murdering an innocent soul on someone else. Instead of crying or begging for mercy, Kazuya simply sighed. Almost half a day has passed since they brought him here, yet nobody came to his rescue. Giants danced in his stomach, requesting food maniacally. He wasn't going to cry and avert his eyes from reality, this was the end. There was no use pretending otherwise. He was fortunate to survive a similar crisis two times. First time with a broken right arm and second time with a bullet hole in his left thigh. He almost lost his little brother because of a misfire between the Yakuza and the police. Both times, the police arrived to negotiate in less than an hour. This time the stakes were too high. Between a university freeloader and a group of EX-class terrorists, a hero of justice like his grandfather would choose the latter. Fucking Gramps, Kazuya cursed under his breath. Kill me, man. He'll hunt you down sooner or later. His grandfather had spoiled him rotten ever since his parents died. The old man gave him a private chef for his daily meals, a maid for his daily needs, a seat in a prestigious school, and most importantly, a home to live in. He was extremely grateful but also resentful. Love was irrational, hatred even more. His life became a terrible joke because of his grandfather's job. He wanted to leave the city, even the fucking country. But his only relative became emotional and possessive, refusing to let Kazuya step out of his protection. He merely wanted to live without constant aggression. Unfortunately, he won't get that peace in this life. The terrorist looked shaken at the mention of Kazuya's grandfather. No, he doesn't care about you. Any last words before we put you out of misery? Last words, huh? Kazuya smiled at the men standing behind the blondie. The chances of making it out alive were almost non-existent. But he wanted to punch this asshole so badly. If he couldn't live, then his enemies shouldn't either. That's how he saw things. No, then. I have a few. Kazuya cut off the blonde man with a friendly smile. Leave a letter for Gramps in my stead. Ask him to transfer all my inheritance to my friend Ryosuke. Ryosuke usually declined Kazuya's attempt to help him. Could Ryosuke refuse the last wish of a dead friend? Definitely not. With some money, Ryosuke could be free from his part-time jobs and live a decent life. And finish the Akame GA Kill manga for me. I haven't read the last few chapters. I heard they were kinda mediocre compared to the rest of the series. I still want to finish it. They kidnapped him near the climax of that heart-wrenching manga. What a tragic timing. The hooligan with a revolver was dumbstruck. Kazuya wasn't lying, though. He really wanted to finish that story and wallow in the falling hollowness for a day or two. Oh wait. 
send a letter to Yumi-sensei as well. Tell her I loved her to death. If she needs money, she can slap my grandfather. Yumi was closest to him after his grandfather and his stupid friend. After a year of corrupting, pursuing his hot teacher, she agreed to date him. He would no longer get to enjoy late private lectures. His life wasn't that bad, per as he. His teacher come girlfriend balanced his daily life with a super possessive, justice hungry grandfather. One more thing. Fuck you and your comrades for kidnapping me now. Couldn't you have planned three more months? My grandfather might have died in an elaborate scheme, I mean accident. You dickheads would have assassinated that stupid president. Jesus Christ, you all are impatient like fucking kindergartners. He took a deep breath after his outburst. It felt like a stone was lifted off of his chest. Ah, there is no better stress relief than yelling. Kazuya's words struck some nerves in his kidnapper as his handsome face turned crimson. You little cunt. Terrorist San pressed the barrel deeper into his forehead. Staring down at his death certainly gave him some regret. His only trouble with death was, does the afterlife exist? If not, where will he go after death? Will he simply stop existing? As he fell into a loop of thoughts, the blonde man squeezed the trigger. Bang! A red sheen filled his vision. A searing pain exploded in his head, making him cry out in agony. His eyes fluttered closed, and his head slumped, the burning sensation gradually waning. Silence fell in the aftermath of his death. Hold on, why can I think? His consciousness was intact after the gunshot. Did his brain survive the bullet from that range? Unlikely, considering the pitch black surrounding him. He was hovering in nowhere, devoid of every sensation, not even the pain inflicted by the bullet. Something was wrong, he could feel it in his bones. An oh-so-familiar floating window emerged in the sea of darkness. Character? Is this system? That shitty reincarnation trope of empowering a protagonist to the divine levels for no reason. He wasn't fond of systems, as they forced unreasonable tasks on their host. Let's not forget the fact that most systems were part of some end-level boss's scheme or given by some alternate version of the main characters. Amidst his confusion, the sensation of his body returned. He felt lurching up and down, the exaggerated motion of a horse's gait all too familiar. He had been riding horses since he was a child, but hadn't straddled one since he graduated from high school. As he blinked away the last vestiges of sleep, he saw a panorama of jagged peaks, craggy summits, and snow-covered ridgelines. The stars were absent in the ink-black sky, only a half-moon fighting a losing battle against the darkness. Was the moon always this close? Hey, you. You're finally awake. Chapter 2, Hueco Mundo Following events happened prior to Kazuya's awakening. Hollows thrived on Rasher, the mystical substance that wove itself into the very soul of every being. The high concentration of Rasher in Hueco Mundo allowed even the weakest Hollows to convert the ambient energy into their Ryoku. Hollows dwelling in Hueco Mundo could survive without consuming souls, unlike their ravenous counterparts that haunted the living world. However, there were those whose insatiable hunger could not be sated by mere rasher or human souls. Compelled by a gnawing void, these hollows resorted to cannibalism, feasting on their own kind. This grisly act of predation spurred their evolution into a new and terrifying breed, the Minos. The Jillians and Ajuchas existed in a perpetual state of predation, each driven by the desire for evolution. Aloof and enigmatic, the vast O Lord surveyed the lesser beings from their lofty perch, seldom finding a soul worthy of increasing their immense power. This relentless cycle of devouring and being devoured was the unspoken law that governed Hueco Mundo, where the weak were inevitably consumed by the strong. The weak become a part of the strong. Among the countless hollows, one was named Emilu Apache. One hollow among the countless was named Emilu Apache. She knew nothing about the origin of her name, but she certainly had a bit of attachment to it. In the hierarchy of hollows, Apache was no weakling, she had triumphed in many battles. Yet it was the sting of her losses that etched deeper grooves into her soul. 
Over time, Apache developed a cunning strategy for survival, avoiding formidable foes with her lithe, deer-like form. When fleeing was impossible, she channeled spiritual energy into her horns, unleashing devastating torrents of Ciro. As an Ajuchas, she possessed immense power, but she chose to subsist on the ambient rasher rather than devouring others. Today has been an easy-going day for the peace-loving deer. She gracefully traversed the vast, moonlit desert, her hooves crunching softly upon the pristine white sands. The pale moon hung low in the sky, casting a ghostly light upon the barren expanse. Abruptly, she halted, her heart pounding in her chest as she caught sight of two cerulean legs protruding from a nearby dune as if their owner had been entombed alive. With her eyes narrowed to mere slits, Apache scanned the desolate horizon, her senses on high alert as she sought to detect the sinister hollows responsible for this trap. I'm no fool. As an Ajuchas, her keen senses could vaguely pick up hollows' presences, even those unseen by her eyes. The result, however, left her stunned. What? There's no one here? Her curiosity peaked. She twisted her elegant neck to survey the surroundings once more before returning her gaze to the slender legs, which seemed too delicate to belong to a hollow. It's none of my damn business, she muttered, turning away and storming off. Yet a minute later, she found herself inexplicably drawn back to the mysterious legs, which remained motionless and unchanged. What on earth is their problem? Unable to quell her curiosity any longer, Apache clamped her teeth into the blue cloth wrapping the leg and yanked its owner free from the sands, finally getting a good look at the stranger. To her amazement, this was a hollow unlike any she had encountered before. Every aspect of his appearance, from his tattered clothes to his disheveled, silvery hair, whispered of humanity. His mask, adorned with twisted horns and wicked teeth, signified his true nature as a hollow and she couldn't help but notice the striking black wings upon his back. A male Apache's experiences with male hollows in Hueco Mundo had been nothing short of disastrous, as they had all sought to eat her in a literal sense. However, this one seemed different. His serene and refined features exuded no aggression, and his weak reatza gave her pause, making her question whether to kill and consume him. He's unconscious, and his legs— her eyes widened in shock. What a terrible fate to suffer. Two translucent holes marred his thighs, reminiscent of a hollow's symbolic heart. While such holes typically caused no interference in daily life, the gaping voids in his legs seemed destined to have dire consequences, as there was scarcely any flesh left to support him. A distant howl sent shivers down Apache's spine, her body tensing with fear. A formidable predator, and a juchas who preyed on weaker ajuchas like her, was nearby. I have to go. Casting a fleeting glance at the unconscious man, she bit his shirt and tossed him into the air. As he landed on her back, she dashed across the moonlit sands. I'll use him as bait, she rationalized, attempting to justify the unexpected surge of compassion that swelled within her for the stranger. In her mind, she reasoned that he would surely perish without assistance in this unforgiving realm. Hey, you. You're finally awake. Kazuya might have mistaken everything for Skyrim opening if the voice speaking to him didn't have a feminine touch. Well, being a dragonborn would have been a fine fate. Kazuya adjusted himself into a more comfortable position on his unexpected mount, a deer-like creature adorned with brown fur on its back and gray skin on its front. Two striking white antlers crowned its head. As he surveyed his surroundings, he realized there was no rider directing the creature, only himself. Apache turned her head, catching a glimpse of Kazuya in her peripheral vision. Are you a vasto lord? she inquired in a slow, husky tone, noting that his size matched the rumored dimensions of the powerful hollows your Riazza doesn't line up with that. Vasto lord? Kazuya furrowed his brow, trying to remember where he had heard the term. It was a familiar phrase, one that lingered on the edge of his memory, but the details remained frustratingly elusive. He strained to dredge it up from the depths of his recollection. Ugh, where did I hear that? At the sound of his whispered question, Apache stopped in her tracks, her ears nearly melting from the pleasant timbre of his voice. His voice is so nice, what am I doing? Snapping out of her reverie, 
She shook her head vigorously, her ears flapping against her face. Do you not know Vasto, Lord? Is this your first day in Hueco Mundo? That can't be right. Minos are born with small humanoid forms like yours. As Apache explained the nature of hollows and their various forms, she wondered if, by some miracle, she had misread the man's riatsu. After all, Kazia was significantly smaller than a typical Jillian and lacked the wildness of an Ajuchas. Behind his mask, Kazia's eyes narrowed in thought. The mention of Hueco Mundo and Minos swept away the fog obscuring his memories, and he gazed around in disbelief. The stark white landscape, with rolling dunes punctuated by barren trees and enormous boulders, seemed surreal yet eerily familiar. The sand appeared lifeless, and the air was still and clear as if made of glass. It was as if he had stepped into a vivid world that mirrored his own reality. In a sudden moment of clarity, he realized that this place perfectly matched the world from a specific anime. Ah! Kazuya barely managed to suppress the urge to scream at the top of his lungs, as his current situation demanded an extreme reaction. Somehow, he had been transported to the world of Shinigami, Hollows, and Quincy, the world of Bleach. It had taken a bullet to his head, but he was finally free from his grandfather's grasp. Is this my reward for putting up with all the bullshit? He drew in a deep breath, filling his lungs with the cold, dusty air that permeated Hueco Mundo. This was neither a dream nor a fabrication of his dying mind. As the reality of his situation settled in, he let out a long sigh. Dear, dear, may I ask your name? Politeness was necessary when one didn't know what the fuck was happening. A little respect went a long way in building trust and preventing unnecessary conflicts. The owner of the voice considered his request for a few seconds. Apache Chapter 3 Character System Apache After some recollection, Kazuya recognized the name. She was one of the Trace Bestias, Tyr Haribel's fraction. Haribel, the tanned Espada with golden hair, easily one of his most favorite female characters ever, led Apache and her two friends. This is rather bizarre. Somehow, he found himself in a timeline preceding the moment when Apache encountered Tyr Haribel and transformed into an Erencar under Aizen. A timeline where the cunning Aizen had not yet seized control of Lost No Chase. Maybe he already did. He couldn't be entirely sure about the convoluted chronology of Bleach. What about yours? Don't expect to take mine without giving yours. Apache snapped at his silence. Cat got your tongue or what? Perhaps it was Kazuya's even temper and obliviousness to Hueco Mundo that put her at ease. She felt no danger, allowing her true character to shine through, while polite on the surface, she was a hollow with a fiery demeanor. Kazuya, he answered, his fingers brushing the skeletal mask that concealed most of his face. It's. This prompted him to observe the other changes in his body. He was wearing the same clothes during his death, a white shirt and jeans, both of which were torn in embarrassing spots, showing his pale white skin. One of those holes exposed the gaping hole in his thighs. Two holes, to be precise. Hmm. I think I remember this. Every hollow's hole, at least in higher evolutions, symbolized an aspect what a hollow lacked in most cases before their death or the cause of their death. He remembered that much from the material. For example, a hollow hole near the stomach signified a craving for strength, whereas one in the eye meant blindness to certain things. What is mine supposed to mean? He gently punched his thigh, then tried moving his legs. He could use his legs just fine. Terrified of your holes? Apache asked. We are hollows. Why tire out your legs walking when we can fly instead? Ha ha, indeed. He chuckled at her indirect attempt to comfort him. So, Apache, where are we headed? How would I know, she retorted. Someplace I don't have to constantly run away from those damning incarnations of gluttony. As if by instinct, Kazuya tenderly stroked her crest, his fingers trailing through the velvety fur that extended down her head. It was a habit he had acquired while horse riding as a gesture of affection for his steed. Watch where you touch. I am not your pet. Despite her irate tone, 
she didn't order him to dismount. He glanced at his legs and smiled, touched by her subtle kindness. Even in a perilous world, she extended her compassion to a stranger. Perhaps she was relieved to discover someone reasonable in Hueco Mundo, a companion who wouldn't betray her and transform her into food. And they say hollows are evil. He would have considered seducing her if she was in her errand car form. He had always harbored a fondness for tomboys. Regrettably, she wouldn't attain her human form any time soon. A shame. Oh, right. I almost forgot about that pop-up window. Character system wasn't it? As if responding to his curiosity, a colossal gray box materialized, obstructing his vision. He skimmed past the status and focused on the three-dimensional model to the side, which displayed his current appearance as if he were a character in a video game. His clothing alone served as ample evidence that the model represented him. Disregarding his newly elongated silver hair and pallid white skin, his gaze fixated on the pair of black, feathery wings. He reached towards his back and grasped the soft bones protruding from his shoulder blades. He gently rolled his shoulder blades, sensing the muscles of his wings stretch and awaken. The wings, stirring from a profound slumber, appeared delicate and shadowy, as though they possessed a life of their own. I have wings. He widened his eyes with anticipation and took a deep breath. His wings fluttered almost hypnotically and then, with an inner strength that he never knew he had, he began to vigorously flap them up and down. The wind generated by his efforts captured Apache's attention. So, can you fly? Kazuya seized his winged antics and patted her back. I don't know. He returned his gaze to the status and discovered that his half-mask bore a striking resemblance to a demonic skull. Its oversized holes revealed his striking blue eyes, and a menacing set of teeth aligned with the mask where it overlapped his lips. Even the twisted horns appeared as though they belonged to a demon. Am I some kind of demon? General Information Name, Kazuya Ishihara Gender, Male Race, Hollow, Vasto Lord Ryurioka Level, Great Level, Captain Class Alignment, Neutral Evil Affiliation, None Racial Abilities Siro, Ryurioku Offensive Technique Mastery level yet to learn. Sonido, movement technique. Mastery level yet to learn. Garganta, limited spatial distortion technique. Mastery level yet to learn. Innate abilities. Silvery voice, your voice can influence people's state of mind. The ability works best in persuading or seducing someone. Unnamed slash undiscovered, manifestation of your hollow heart. Crumbling heart, hollow living beings classified as hollow receive nourishment and enhancements. Regeneration, your wounds regenerate automatically. The time required depends on the severity of wounds. Acquired abilities. Seduction, the ability to seduce those of the opposite gender. Mastery level basic. Writing, the ability to write a mount. Mastery level intermediate. Arithmetic, the ability to process arithmetic problems. Mastery level intermediate. Equipment. Fine cotton shirt. Denim jeans. Did I lose some memories? This certainly wasn't the status of a hollow who had just been born. A vast o lord with Ryurioku rivaling a captain class, such power placed him near the apex of Hueco Mundo's hierarchy. In the grand scheme of things, however, he remained little more than high class fodder. He simply couldn't measure up to endgame villains like the Quincy Sturmriders. Neutral evil. It makes sense. He had always sought freedom, regardless of whether it violated laws. Not to mention the disdain he harbored for his grandfather, who risked his life for the greater good of society. Indeed, he never quite fit the mold of a lawful individual. Next came the racial abilities, a set of unlearned skills inherent to all vast O Lord. Nothing extraordinary there. The truly exceptional aspects lay within his list of innate abilities. People had always complimented his voice, which also granted him an easier time with women. He couldn't fathom that this turned out to be one of his innate abilities. Crumbling Heart 
Despite its menacing name, it appeared to be a team-oriented ability that offered no tangible benefits to him personally. It could prove useful should he find trustworthy hollow allies. Scratch that, he would either seduce hollow women into trusting him or subdue them through the natural law of hollows. Unknown Hollow Heart He relegated the unknown aspect to the back of his mind and perused the remainder of his status. His skills were hardly extraordinary. In fact, they wouldn't be considered overpowered in a world where a Quincy could bring his imagination to life and another could glimpse the future and manipulate it at will. This can't be it. There have to be other functions. A thunderous roar snatched away his attention before he could embark on another exploration of his system. Apache trembled, recognizing the owner of the roar. It's back. Arg, we're dead. So dead. A few days prior, she had encountered the giant Ajuchas, her sonido and natural agility had enabled her to escape its ravenous maw. However, her current Ryurioku wasn't sufficient to use her rudimentary level sonido for more than 30 seconds, not enough time to evade the Ajuchas hellbent on consuming her. An enemy? This is troublesome. He had yet to master basic hollow techniques, such as controlling his Ryurioku or spiritual power. While he could rival an average captain-class Shinigami in terms of Ryurioka quantity, he possessed no experience in controlling it. You bet it is. Apache kicked the ground, accelerating her pace. Learn to fly, damn it. I can't carry you everywhere like a slave. Their predator appeared atop the hill behind them, a colossal snake-like beast with eight arms and the lower body of a caterpillar. The skeletal mask on its head and the bone-like armor on its shoulders detracted somewhat from its fearsome appearance. The monster seemed right at home amidst the desolate, agony-filled landscape of Hueco Mundo. The Ajuchas leaped down the hill and pursued them with its numerous writhing legs, kicking up a sandstorm in its wake. There is only one fate awaiting you, little deer. Cease your resistance and become a part of a greater Ajuchas like me. Kazuya remained oddly unfazed by the situation, as if his mind refused to acknowledge the massive beast as a threat. He patted Apache's back. Buy me some time. I'll kill him. Chapter 4 Annihilation Apache could feel the confidence seeping from his voice like a warm, invigorating elixir, expelling the fear and doubts that had been ricocheting in her mind. She found herself unable to question the source of his conviction, as though she had faith in him. A hollow, having faith. She scoffed, a touch of incredulity coloring her thoughts. Trust me. Then, like a gentle breeze, his pleasant whisper caressed her ears, washing away her skepticism. She was akin to a desperate moth, drawn irresistibly towards a blazing inferno. Apache groaned at the ludicrous predicament she found herself in. Her choices had been whittled down to two, perishing inside a hollow stomach or placing trust in the man who exuded unwavering confidence in his abilities. Don't let me die! Channeling her Ryurioku into her legs, a thunderous boom reverberated behind her. Though her sonido skills were unremarkable, the sudden acceleration caught Kazuya off guard. The wind slapped against his face, a sensation that would have sent his old body careening through the air. In his current state, however, the wind felt invigorating, reminiscent of riding his Suzuki. I love this world. Seizing the opportunity, he closed his eyes and immersed himself in the energy coursing within him. Controlling Ryurioku was an innate instinct for every hollow, and he deftly guided the flow of energy with his thoughts. Easier than I thought. Suddenly, Apache's knees buckled as she was subjected to his bone-chilling Ryatsu. Her stumbles sent them crashing down, and Kazuya's clothes became even more tattered after tumbling across the ghostly white sand. Picking himself up and dusting off his clothes, he appeared in scathed after the devastating crash. His hollow holes posed no hindrance to his movements, serving solely as ornamental symbols. The sand in Hueco Mundo was peculiar, its grains bonded more tightly than those on a beach, as if an invisible energy held them together. Foo. I'm not a cripple. Meanwhile, awestruck and petrified, Apache gaped at the brilliant blue Ryatsu emanating from Kazuya, her body rendered immobile. The concentration of his Ryatsu surpassed that of an Ajuchis class, hinting at a power beyond. 
as if. Haha, I didn't think there would be another one with you, laughed the colossal Ajuchas, oblivious to Kazuya's Ryatsu as if his senses had been severely dulled. In truth, the snake-like hollow was teetering on the brink of regression. I'll eat you, first, then savor the female there. Kazuya pivoted toward the ravenous Ajuchas and focused his Ryurioku into his hand. A dense sphere of azure energy materialized, its very existence warping the air around it. What can, suddenly, an icy shiver raced down the Ajuchas' spine, electrifying his nerves. His heart hammered wildly as he swiveled around, his eyes wide with panic and dread, desperately seeking an escape from the spine-chilling presence lurking behind him. Zero. At Kazuya's command, the sphere of energy launched forward, expanding into a thick beam of light. The zero ray obliterated the hollow's mask and head before tearing a gaping hole through the mountain in the distance. Kazuya's first kill left him reeling, but for entirely different reasons. Holy cow, I'm strong. Racial ability, Ciro learned. Current master level, basic. The sheer destruction caused by his rudimentary Ciro mastery left him in awe. He could barely fathom the mind of a fully mastered Ciro. Shaking his head, he approached Apache, who remained in a state of shock, understandably so. The Ajuchas that had nearly ended her life, he eradicated him with a single Ciro attack. As she gazed into his eyes, it seemed as though she was attempting to discern his true intentions. H. Huh. He was a vast O Lord Hollow, a being that most, if not all, Hollows in Hueco Mundo feared. While not as numerous as Jillian's and ordinary Hollows, Ajuchas could be found throughout Hueco Mundo, particularly in Los Noches. Is he going to eat me? She swallowed hard and unsteadily got to her feet. Being devoured by him seemed more tolerable than meeting her end at the hands of the giant Ajuchas, but she refused to go down without a fight. I, I won't die easily. Oblivious to her self-inflicted dilemma, he jumped onto her and stroked her back. I told you to trust me, and I think I'm a vast O Lord. No shit. She whispered, suddenly aware of the weight on her back. Huh? What's the meaning of this? Are you going to, she stopped herself, not wanting to give him any ideas. What if, he doesn't know that hollows become stronger by eating? She found it highly possible, as he wasn't aware of his own power as a vast O Lord until now. Perhaps he lost his memories during a fight and ended up getting buried where she found him. She could speculate her entire life about his past and still wouldn't find the exact reason for his moments of ignorance. Stop murmuring things. We gotta move. Apache's tail slapped his back in protest, the only act of defiance she could muster in her current position. You can walk and fly. Get off my back. He leaned down and caressed her ears. I'll protect you from hollows. You'll let me ride you. A fair deal, right? Hueco Mundo seemed dreadfully dull without much variation in the environment. He needed her in his life, or he might just succumb to boredom. His soothing voice momentarily left her speechless. Fair deal my foot. I'm not accepting it because I'm gee grateful to you for saving me. Her flustered voice contradicted her feigned annoyance. Unable to handle the embarrassment, she strutted along obediently and quickened her pace. Kazuya rolled his eyes. Her behavior strongly resembled that of Atsundara, with the way she masked her gratitude beneath a facade of irritation. To be honest, he found the trait irritating. Seeing people being dishonest with their feelings, hiding their true emotions behind a veil of stubbornness, could be incredibly frustrating at times. Do you want to eat him? He asked. You can if you feel like it. Vasto Lord, like him, didn't need to eat to evolve, and he didn't use enough Ryurioku to feel hungry. Not that he was interested in eating a giant blob of unsavory raw flesh. The thought alone repulsed him. My only evolution from here is Arankar. To achieve this, he would have to find a way to remove his mask. He recalled that Apache and her friends hadn't been Vasto Lord when they met Aizen, they had become Arankar with the help of Hogyoku, which proved that the transformation was possible for any hollow. How am I supposed to do it? Just rip off my mask. The mere thought of tearing away his mask filled him with an instinctual, 
primal fear, akin to the terror a mortal being might feel when faced with the cold embrace of death. Interesting. No wonder Aizen had needed the Hogyoku to blur the line between Hollow and Shinigami in order to create Arankar. Overcoming this innate fear would demand an extraordinary amount of willpower and conviction, qualities that not every Hollow possessed. Many would falter, either dying in the process or succumbing to their primitive instincts. I'll need more information before trying it. As Kazuya was lost in thought, Apache snuck a furtive glance at the fallen hollow. She swallowed hard, her hunger gnawing at her insides after using up her Ryuryoku. As an Ajuchas, she needed to consume others to maintain her individuality and rank, or else she would regress into her Jillian form, never to rise above Minos Grande again. For many, such a fate was considered worse than death. I won't say thank you because you provided me food, she declared with a huff. Kazuya gently patted her back and offered a warm smile. It's difficult for you to be honest with your words, isn't it? Arg! I'm completely honest. In the midst of his amusing banter, Kazuya felt a sudden, sharp prickling sensation on his back. He slowly turned to look over his shoulder, his eyes narrowing behind his mask as he scanned the horizon. Atop a distant hill, a white figure stood, appearing hazy even to his enhanced vision. However, where his eyes failed him, his knowledge of the Bleach universe came to his aid, helping him identify the mysterious hollow. Tear Haribel Chapter 5 Goals Kazuya's eyes narrowed, taking on the intensity of a predator stalking its prey. The wheels in his mind turned with an audible creak as he tried to recall all the details of Bleach. He was having difficulty remembering certain things, but there was one image that stuck in his head, a tan woman with hair the color of shimmering gold, her seductive curves hugged by a white skin-tight jacket, and her ever-so-composed gaze holding an air of authority. The future numero trace of Espada, Tyr Haribel. She should still be a vast o lord like me. Unlike other hollows, Tyr Haribel kept most of her humanity in this form. She, who didn't mind sacrificing her life for her fraction, her aspect of death was fittingly sacrifice. Hot, strong, and extremely devoted to her closed ones. Yep, just my type of woman. He never hesitated when it came to women. Otherwise, he wouldn't have gone after his teacher instead of his fellow students. Was his new race going to stop his vile seductions? Nope. His new race merely elevated his goal. Now he could live without the restraints of conventional morals. He didn't mind meddling with the plot either. The timeline already veered off course as soon as he interacted with this tomboyish sundra deer serving as his mount. He wasn't going to live in fear because of things beyond his control. After all, he was a... What was that? The word representing something crucial teased the tip of his tongue, only to vanish like a fleeting shadow. He scratched his head, furrowing his brow as he tried to summon the lost thought. It never returned. Haribel also disappeared from the hill while he was confused. Fuck. System, tell me about your functions. An awkward silence answered his inquiry. He asked the same question several times, only to receive a cold shoulder from his system. A system without sentience. Am I in the wrong genre? He sighed and turned his attention to Apache. She quietly nibbled at the hollow, like a delicate mouse picking at a giant will of cheese. At her pace, it would take weeks to finish the towering beast. Fortunately, she had her fill in a few minutes, restoring her Ryoku to nearly full. Kazuya patted her back gently and directed her toward Haribel's location. Don't think I'll let you ride me everywhere, Apache grumbled with reluctance, yet still obeyed his command. This is maddening. Listen here, you little dear. You can ride me when you become an Arankar. Arankar? Apache shook her head. I don't know what an Arankar is, but sure. I'll ride you once I become Arankar. That's a promise then. There was nothing ostensibly alarming about his proposition, yet Apache felt like a mouse that had willingly walked into a mousetrap. The unabashed happiness in his voice sent a shiver down her spine, leading her to wonder what she had just agreed to. After nearly an hour of searching, 
he didn't find any trace of Haribel, as if she had retreated into her base after she saw him annihilate the Ajuchas. She may have mistaken him for another bloodthirsty monster. As a lover of peace and a hater of sacrifice, she went out of her way to avoid conflict with him. You know what, Apesai? I'm gonna practice flying. It would be a colossal waste not to utilize his wings. He stood on Apache's back and leaped into the air. She howled behind him as he spread his wings like an eagle preparing for flight. His feet brushed the sand before his wings powerfully flapped, thrusting the air downwards. A swirling cloud of white sand enveloped Apache. She coughed a few times before forcefully expelling the sand with a riatsu. Damn, get away from me. Kazuya nearly tumbled out of the sky with a sudden shift but managed to stay afloat with nimble flaps of his wings. He felt like he was learning the delicate art of balance all over again. As he practiced, the movement of his wings became more familiar. In just an hour, he was soaring through Waco Mundo's skies, while Apache gazed up at him with envy. You can't fly? Apache shook her head at his question. I can create footholds under my feet with my riatsu. It's not the same as flying, and boy, does it use a lot of ririoku. The dense concentration of rasher in Hueco Mundo made it more difficult to create footholds in the air. While any hollow could fly in the world of living due to its low concentration of rasher, Apache's conservative approach to life ruled out flying because of its expensive energy cost. Creating footholds? Kazuya mumbled, his wings continuing their steady rhythm. He manifested his riatsu and focused it beneath his feet, instantly feeling a stable platform materialize. Like this? You improve fast, Apache granted him a rare compliment. I don't find it draining, though. If she had fingers, she would be flipping the middle ones at his face. Kazuya chuckled. With nothing else to do, he began training his racial abilities. As a creature of instincts, he possessed a basic understanding of each one. Mastering his racial abilities was simply a matter of investing time and effort. While frolicking with Apache, he stumbled upon another hollow, which he rapidly dispatched with a powerful Ciro. He felt grateful for his reincarnation as a vast O-Lord, random hollows and ajuchas posed no threat to him. At present, his most significant concern was the hollow reigning over the land of Las Noches as its king. His arsenal lacked the means to counter that skeleton guy's decay ability. It was wiser not to provoke him. That reminds me of Ulquiora. Wasn't he a natural errand car? He saw some hope in fulfilling this seemingly life-threatening task. Ulquiora transformed into an errand car by accidentally breaking his mask. There were more circumstances at play for sure. Are Espadas a thing yet? He remembered Aizen crafting his own Hogyoku to experiment with hollows and create errand cars. However, he was clueless about the current state of Espada as an organization. Forget about Espada. I should make some personal goals. Shaking his head, he pondered some personal goals. After all, everyone needed to strive for something to keep life interesting. His objectives were straightforward, such as traveling across Hueco Mundo to find Tyr Haribel, honing his vast lord's power to its limits, and becoming an Arancar. He also wanted Apache to become an Arancar, just so he could fuck around with someone. Seducing her would take nearly zero effort. Heaving a sigh, he let his gaze wander. Let's take it slow. One day at a time. He had only just been born. As a hollow, he possessed all the time in the world to experiment with new ideas. It's always night in Hueco Mundo, don't you know? Apache snickered. You silly goose. Chapter 6 Conviction In Hueco Mundo, the concept of day and night, entertainment, and laws were as absent as cheerful colors in a graveyard as if its creator sculpted it with a satirical nod to hell. Weary of the desolate ambience, Kazuya sought refuge in a natural cave tucked within a mountain. Ah, he groaned in frustration. Kubo, you bastard. This is so hard. Apache looked at him oddly. Kubo? Who is Kubo? I don't know, he said with a sigh. I'm a little frustrated. Why? I'll tell you later. 
let's rest for now. Apache agreed with the sentiment and laid flat on the ground. Her position revealed the see-through hollow hole in her stomach. Discerning the symbolic meaning behind Apache's hollow hole was ridiculously simple. She was fed up with being pursued. Thus, she craved the strength to survive. He oversimplified her present desire as he had no means of delving into her past life. Good night. Kazuya folded his wings to make them as small as possible and rested his head on Apache, careful to avoid her hollow hole in case it caused her discomfort. Irritated by his wings, he turned to his side. Where do you think you're sleeping? We had a deal, remember? Let's add something else to it. I'll use you as a pillow. You can do the same when you become an Arancar. In her Arancar form, she wasn't very tall, while he was nearly six feet three inches, possibly taller after transforming into a hollow. He could handle her with ease. Fine. Apache huffed and rested her head on the ground. He was the most insolent man she had ever met, not that she had any chance to deeply know anyone beside him. Ignorant guy. Wake me up if anyone tries to attack. Don't fight on your own. And he was also the most considerate one. Kazuya touched his mask, and dread consumed him. He hesitated in tearing off his mask, as a wrong step could spell his death. I'll find some hollows to experiment with, preferably a juches. Apache glanced at him through her peripheral vision. His quiet reflection made her uneasy. You keep mentioning Arankar this, Arankar that. What is an Arankar? A hollow whose essence is closer to a Shinigami. We supposedly get this power from taking off our mask. Are you crazy? Apache retorted. The mask is a part of our soul. Take off the mask and we'll lose the power to control Ryoku. We might even die or reform into a Jillian. Once in a Juchas regressed, they could never regain their form. They would forever be stuck wandering the Hueco Mundo as a giant, mindless Jillian. No Juchas wanted to suffer from such fate thus driving them to devour other hollows. Kazuya reached out and playfully tugged the unicorn-like horn protruding from her forehead. Have faith in your determination to defy the norms. Well, who am I preaching to, anyway? You'd have been toast if I hadn't stepped up back there. I, she wanted to say something but hesitated. There is no point. Arankar or not, we are just biding time. This is Hueco Mundo, damn it. Don't make me say the obvious. They were going to die one day, she had realized the truth after witnessing the cycle of hollows consuming the weaker ones. She wanted to die peacefully, if possible. Kazuya didn't expect his teasing to elicit such a dramatic reaction from her. She was getting emotional over her eventual death. What obvious? That we're just prolonging our doom by surviving? That some hollow will come that we can't defeat and devour us whole? Apache nodded vigorously. We can never be the strongest. You're underestimating the power of a vast O Lord Arankar, he rebuked in an intense voice. One more thing. After dying in the world of living, shouldn't we, Hollows, make the most out of life here? Are you ready to throw down the towel and let some disgusting worm tear you limb from limb and savor your juicy legs? You will let it happen without retaliating? He had felt weak in his entire life. Never ever was he going to experience the same fate. Gnashing her teeth loudly, she threw a furious glare his way. Hell no. I want to live in peace. Then say it with me. I'll kick every ass in Hueco Mundo and become the strongest Arankar. Why are you making me say embarrassing things? Say it. His whisper brushed by her ears, making her groan. I'll kick every ass and become the strongest Arankar. She doubted herself until she said it out aloud. His conviction forced her to believe that she, a hollow who barely held enough Ryatsu to be in the Juchas, could become the strongest Arankar. She felt refreshed, so much so that she repeated in a cheery voice, I'll become the strongest Arankar. Kazuya smiled at her brimming confidence. We're off to such a fantastic start, young lady. After a dreamless sleep, Kazuya absent-mindedly browsed through the status shown by his system. General Information Name, 
Kazuya Ishihara. Gender, male. Race, hollow, vasto lord. Ryurioka level, great level, captain class. Alignment, neutral evil. Affiliation, none. Racial abilities. Siro, Ryurioku offensive technique. Mastery level, intermediate. Sonido, movement technique. Mastery level, basic. Garganta, limited spatial distortion technique. Mastery level, yet to learn. He had already grasped all the basic Vasto Lord abilities except for Garganta. Garganta was useful for crossing over to the world of living and Syriidei. He left its mastery for later, focusing on enhancing the combat abilities first. The world of living. The faces of his ex-girlfriend and friends surfaced in his mind. He had come from a different universe, otherwise, he wouldn't possess any meta-knowledge of this universe. That much was clear to him. They must have buried me, if terrorist Sam was kind enough to leave my body intact. As much as he missed their presences, he preferred his new life. Sure, it was boring at a glance, but he had the freedom to go anywhere. While cheering himself up like a fool, he spotted an intriguing detail in the system interface. Every row, except his equipment and abilities, had a pencil icon at the end, he tapped the symbol next to the gender out of curiosity. Options available for gender stat. 1. Male. 2. Female. 3. Androgynous. The list went on forever, showing absurd names as gender. Helicopter? How is that a gender? Kazuya regretted experimenting on gender stat. At least he discovered one crucial element from this mishap, he could customize his status to some degree. The system referred to itself as character system for this very reason. His eyes wandered to the race icon, which sported the same pencil icon. Will it work? He gulped down his saliva. Every race in Bleach had unique abilities. Shinigami had Zampakudo, which could unlock Shirkai and Bankai stages. Halo had Siro, Sonido, then Arankar had their own versions of Zampakudo to release different forms. Quincy with their own set of abilities, like Blood Vene and other busted techniques. Then there were Foolbringers born from extremely rare circumstances. The versatility of every race, he'd love to possess that power. Only one person in the Bleach universe will come to have blood from each major race, Ichigo Kurosaki, the protagonist. The godly hybrid of Shinigami, Quincy, Hollow, and Foolbringer. Even that level of power failed against the almighty Yawatch. It just went to show how terrifying the father of Quincy truly was. With glazed eyes, he reached for the edit button positioned after the race option while bracing for disappointment. Options available for race. Soul. Human. The two options startled him. The second option seemed utterly unnecessary. He didn't want to become powerless again. Can you show things in more detail? Defying his expectations, a long list of options appeared before him. Chapter 7, My Aspect of Death Loading Evolution Database Function Soul, the purest form of a being. Current path of evolution, hollow hollows are souls who materialize their inner heart through the corruption of sins. They lose their minds to raw instincts and animalistic desires. They have existed since the primordial times. Soul, base form, to base hollow, materialization of inner heart and domination by raw instincts, achieved, to Jillian, fusion with souls of similar affinity, achieved, to Ajuchas, formation of a new consciousness capable of dominating raw instincts, achieved, to Vasto Lord, partial harmony of raw instincts with consciousness, achieved. Potential evolutions in this path, Arankar to Error. Error Slash Alternative path of soul evolution, Shinigami souls who manifest their inner heart by external means. Soul, base form, to error. Error. Human, a soul residing in a vessel of Kishi to interact with the world of living. Potential path of human evolution, Quincy question mark. Human, base, achieved, to Quincy. Alternate potential path of human evolution, Fullbringer question mark. 
Evolution Database will be constantly updated with your knowledge. The wealth of information overwhelmed Kazuya. As he sifted through the options, he noticed an asterisk at the end, accompanied by an explanation for the numerous question marks scattered throughout the list. It became clear that the status only reflected what he knew or remembered, any gaps in his knowledge or memory resulted in the mysterious question marks. When did I achieve a Juch's class? The achieved marks hinted that he might have started as a simple hollow. Somehow, those memories vanished or were discarded after he became a Vasto Lord. They don't matter now. He narrowed his eyes at the tick mark available in front of every potential evolution path. He could regress to a previous evolution and even try out the Quincy path. It was a convoluted approach compared to his desired ability to switch races at will. Well, he wasn't going to complain about a power with plenty of potential down the line. This also implied, I can become a Shinigami. His face beamed with excitement. Most of the Bleach story took place in the Soul Society, and most of the intriguing characters lived there. Compared to the intriguing events of the Soul Society, Hueco Mundo felt stupidly plain. I want to meet Mama Unohana and Yuruchi and Rukia. Setting his interests aside, remaining in Hueco Mundo as a Vasto Lord would attract Aizen's attention. Rather than waiting, it seemed better to move to the Soul Society and grow stronger by obtaining a Zampakudo. He acted passively his whole life, letting others decide his fate. What did he receive in exchange? A life of mental anguish and a lead bullet through his head. Now, he had knowledge of the future, the power to switch races, and a ridiculously useful system. He possessed all the necessary tools to become strong and live on his own terms. How pathetic would it be if he became a doll dancing on Eisen's palm? It won't happen. Anger swelled at the possibility of being controlled like a puppet. After all, he had no control over his previous life. No freedom to decide his future or even the freedom to leave home outside of curfew hours. He despised such a life with passion. His eyes behind the mask suddenly widened as an epiphany dawned on him. He vied for control all his life. A rebel who always wished to resist his grandfather's control. That control slowly slipped away, and he had to live under oppression, that was his life's biggest regret. Aspect of Death Realized Innate Ability, Aspect of Death Oppression Unlocked Laughter erupted from him, as if insanity had taken hold of him. The cave reverberated with his maniacal cackles. Death by Oppression Ah, this is perfect. I love it. Apache wondered if the brutal nature of Hueco Mundo had shattered his sanity in a day. Boy, don't lose it. You can fight it. Push down your instincts. He turned to Apache with a feral grin, his terrorizing aura emphasized by his menacingly glowing eyes. What do you mean? I am a perfectly sane human being. Yes, I am. Apache couldn't help but miss his gentle, considerate voice. This rowdy Kazuya sucks. Kazuya didn't step outside the cave for the next several hours. He wasn't looking to achieve Hikikomori status in Hueco Mundo. To truly grasp the concept of Aaron Cars, he had to get acquainted with the basics of being a hollow. He opted for closed door cultivation to hone his Vasto Lord's strength and unlock the full potential of his new innate ability. The evolution database provided the basic knowledge, while his own mind filled the gaps. Firstly, hollows weren't the mindless soul eaters the Soul Society portrayed them as. In fact, Bleach showed they were quite different. The more he learned, the more intriguing complexities arose, complicating his intended path. Questions swirled in his mind, why did a hollow have a mask? Why did they consume others to fill the void in their souls? What was the nature of the void that expanded with their craving for souls? Why did most hollows become more human-like after reaching the Ajuchas class? And most importantly, what exactly was this inner heart that triggered the creation of a hollow? Most importantly, what exactly was the inner heart that triggered a hollow's creation? He had numerous theories, but none could be confirmed. Eventually, he abandoned the pursuit of the inner heart's true purpose and shifted his focus to hollow evolutions. Every evolution after Jillian placed great emphasis on suppressing raw instincts. 
the raw instincts that turn them into hyenas for souls instead of flesh. Each evolution beyond Jillian emphasized suppressing primal instincts, which had driven them to become ravenous soul-seekers. Aaron Carr's, for the most part, resembled Shinigami. He closed his eyes, his mind swirling with countless theories. After several minutes of contemplation, he opened his eyes, now gleaming with newfound understanding. He felt like a hermit who had achieved enlightenment. I see. Minos don't eat others to become strong and evolve. The primary goal is strengthening their consciousness, which suppresses their raw instincts. Failure to do so would result in regression to Jillian class. The theory made too much sense to be false or delusional. Then Aaron Cars. His lips curved into a smirk as he realized the true intent of tearing the mask for Aaron Karization. Aizen was right about separating boundaries between Ahalo and Shinigami to create an Aaron car. But there was more to the process, otherwise, there wouldn't be natural Aaron cars like Ulquiora Cypher and Coyote Stark. Let's test my theory and my new ability. Turning to his drowsy companion, he patted her mask. Come with me. Hmm, where are we going? To cause some chaos, my little friend. Let us toy with the destiny of some hapless souls. Apache looked at him as if he had lost his mind. Chapter 8 Oppression How would anyone imagine the ability of oppression? The power to overwhelm someone to the point they have no chance to fight back. The power to crush someone under sheer pressure like a bug. The manifestation of Kazuya's aspect of death worked similarly, yet worlds apart from those concepts. It was truly a breathtaking ability. He went out in search of a foe to test its effectiveness. Lo and behold, he found four massive hollows hibernating in an underground cave. They were Minos Grande. Unlike Ajucha's and Vasto Lord, a Minos Grande surpassed the height of an average house in Japan each cloaked in black wearing a mask with an extending nose bearing three holes. Despite their giant size, they were considered foot soldiers in Lost No Chase, as they were below Ajuchas in strength and raw power, and were more commonly known as Jillian. All the Jillians screeched as they sensed the intruders. Apache shivered. They will chew us alive. Let's run. She was terrified of four Jillians blasting her with their Ciro. Kazuya merely smiled and stretched his hand towards the Jillians. Oppress atmospheric air. A blue Riatsu surrounded the intimidating giant hollows, and the wind howled like a wolf. Atmospheric air was everywhere, just like Rasher in Hueco Mundo. In a wide open world, the air alone weighed over hundreds of thousands of pounds. Typically, the internal body pressure cancelled the atmospheric air while body tissues absorbed the rest of the net force. The oppression overturned that perfect balance in favor of pure destruction. A Jillian's body structure was incomparably more resilient than human, but could it survive nearly a ton of pressure from all sides? The answer revealed itself in the form of cracking bones. Flesh ruptured and blood spurted. In an expected turn of events, the four Jillians, towering over four stories, crumbled in balls of grotesque flesh. Amazing! The sheer force of his innate ability left him astonished. Aspect of death, oppression oppression crushes all by infallible authority. With the power of oppression, you can heighten any aspect of a physical body, be it your surroundings or a part of your enemy's body. Ryoku's consumption will be increased depending on the resistance faced and your comprehension of the aspect. A fitting ability for the man who always lived under the constant oppression of his grandfather, albeit a mental one. He could amplify one aspect of his surroundings as long as it existed physically. He could technically raise anyone's heartbeat and destroy their heart. An instant death that would require immense Ryurioku varying from individual to individual. The ability, however, wasn't perfect, its energy consumption was its biggest drawback, followed by its conditions. Just one use against Jillian's drained his Ryurioku by nearly a quarter. The efficiency would be even worse if he tried to control stronger hollows. The ability wouldn't work if his opponent repelled his Ryatsu with a greater concentration of Ryoku. I need to expand my knowledge if I want to fully harness this ability. He regretted skipping physics classes and having some juicy time with his math professor, who happened to be his girlfriend. 
Apache stared at Jillian's in horror, an icy shiver clinging to her spine. The incomprehensible power left her in awe and terror. The random hollow she found was a terrifying slaughter machine. What did you do? Apache whispered, shock refusing to leave her face. Is this the true ability of a Vasto Lord? Hmm. He tilted his head and smiled innocently. You wouldn't understand even if I told you. And no, not every Vasto Lord should have something so terrifying. You little rascal. Apache never wanted to skewer someone with her horns until now. His innocent ridicule truly pissed her off. I will, she paused, her eyes darting toward the distant hills, a primal terror overtaking her. Kazuya chuckled. You sensed it too? Apache slowly nodded at his question. My senses are vastly superior to other Ajuchas. Her senses may have developed from her cowardly way of life, but she took pride in her achievement. Survival in Hueco Mundo depended on several things. Faster, stronger, and smarter, she had two things better than her counterparts. Commendable. The youth, who only thought about his self-interests, grinned ear to ear. They came at the right time. Apache, why don't you hide in some corner and let me deal with them? The newcomers didn't bother hiding their Riatsu, which surpassed Apache's Riatsu by a small margin. Apache didn't obey his order, standing rooted to her position. The hell do you think you're talking to? I'm not some weenie coward. Watch my Ciro rip them to shreds. Her Ryurioku fully recovered after eating the hollow, she could destroy weaker hollows with her Ciro rays even if she was no match for a male Ajuchas. You are finally showing some backbone, Kazuya whispered and gently rubbed her hollow mask. I love it when you show Susie determination. GRRR, don't treat me like a pet. The enemy showed up soon. A humanoid lizard like hollow standing over two meters, a gargantuan monkey like hollow with a white mask, and another one in the form of a giant crow towering over his companions. Three ajuchas with hostile intentions appeared before him. It was only natural for him to treat them like dolls in a dollhouse. A white puny goat and a deer, the monkey said in a sharp voice. They match the image of two hollows killing my subordinates around this place. Let's crush them and go back to Lord Berrigan. The crow nodded at the words of his fellow indirect subordinates of the undisputed king of Hueco Mundo. They had let out their hollow subordinates to evolve in the wild, only to be killed by newcomers. A pay-sized response, a crispy beam of Cyril Ray that scorched the monkey's fur around his chest, leaving a bloody mess. You pathetic monkey, I am a reindeer. Kazuya also has wings. He is no goat. Open your damn eyes before spitting bullshit. Goddamn. Kazuya beamed a smile at the furious hollows while patting Apache's head. That's not a friendly way to approach our guests, now is that? Hey you three, why don't we sit down in my cave and chat about your life troubles? I'm an A-grade listener. A professional therapist. The heck are you saying? Apache retorted. They are mad now. You dare to mock me, a retainer of Lord Baradin's court? You will pay for this. Death to the sinner. The hollows roared with rage and charged at him. He vanished in a blink of an eye, leaving a sonic boom. He reappeared moments later several meters away with his sonido technique. He left the hollows in the dust with his speed. No need to be so mad. Jeez. He raised his hand from Apache's head and released the full pressure of his Vasto Lord class Riatsu. You guys should die, but that's not what I want. You'll be part of something great. Be happy that you died for a great cause. The hollows felt as if the sky collapsed as their very souls shivered in terror. His Riatsu was ripping their souls. A Vasto Lord? Curse our luck. What is a Vasto Lord doing here? Fuck! The realization came far too late, their deaths were written in stone the moment they approached him with malicious intent. Apache, who was behind Kazuya, merely felt a fraction of his oppressive Riatsu. Even that left her shaken to her core. Vasto Lord are crazy strong. How great would it be to have such power? 
she could say goodbye to her run and hide life and live the way Kazuya mentioned without fearing the inevitable end. A desire not so different from Indy flooded her chest. Alas, she was one of those Ajuchas class who barely received any strength increase even after consuming an Ajuchas class hollow to put it simply, she lacked the potential to become a Vasto Lord. Backing down on a promise irked her. She gritted her teeth. Screw Vasto Lord. I'm becoming the strongest Arankar. Chapter 9, Nightmares Sometime earlier A gray snake with a white underbelly slithered across the white dunes of Hueco Mundo. The three pink dots on either side of her head and the three pearls hanging from her white oyster-like mask all but confirmed her gender. Walking by this snake was a fierce lioness with pieces of white armor on her four legs. What set this lioness apart was a golden mask and a golden mane extending beyond it. Both Ajucha's females followed the lead of a golden-haired woman relatively small compared to her companions. A light blue layer of skin-tight suit covered her from neck to bottom, nearly merging with her healthy olive skin. A white, bone-like armor covered most of her body, with gills on her limbs and ribs. Sharp protrusions rose from her shoulders like pauldrons to an armor. A long tail extended from the back of her head, the tail had a shark-like fin in the middle and two joint fins at its end. A giant white broadsword, like an elongated shark thong, was fused with her arm. She was a powerful Vasto Lord. Era, Mila Rose, walk in front of us. We might lose sight of you in this darkness. Gah, this snake bitch. Why is she so damn tall? The snake and the lioness yelled at each other. The snake reared up, her white scales shimmering in the dark, and hissed a warning. The lioness crouched low, eyes blazing, and roared her challenge. They faced each other like they were arch-rivals. Tyr Harabelt shook her head. Sitting in a cave wasn't the most exciting thing in the world, so Harabelt and her two comrades went for strolls in the white ashes desert enveloping Hueco Mundo. Sometimes she stumbled upon ruins from the ancient era inhabited by hollows. Sometimes she found empty chambers. Sometimes she met people they could trust. The sense of a discovery on the horizon kept Harabelle pushing every day. Today, too, they came out for a stroll, but her companions wouldn't stop fighting. Cyan Sung Sun, the Snake Hollow, turned to her leader. Harabelle had a habit of calmly observing the situation and then speaking her mind. Harabelle's sudden grim look spoke of hidden dangers. Harabelle Sama? Hearing Sun Sun's serious voice, Francesca Mila Rose lowered her growl. Ha! Harabel Sama, what is the matter? I sense a strong Riatsu. Harabel stopped in her path and blocked her comrades with her sword like arm. Her golden brows knitted in a concerned frown. A battle, perhaps. It doesn't concern us, said the lioness. Leave it be, no? Mila Rose's tone embody her matter of course, indifference to other lives. Harabelle had brought her and Sung Sun together to protect each other from other hollows, even if Harabelle did most of the heavy work. Intervening in others' battles didn't sit well with Mila Rose. We'll observe from a distance, Harabelle addressed Mila Rose. Follow me. The cool and composed Vasto Lord made a quick decision and sprinted ahead without her comrade's response. Sun Sun hissed. Harabel Sama has more compassion for lives than both of us. It's about time we accept it. Harabel always forgave the Hollows who tried to attack them, even admitting that she despised killing. She still killed the most pesky one every once in a while to let Sun Sun and Mila Rose maintain their current Ajucha status. But she didn't help them devour Hollows to evolve further. Sun Sun and Mila Rose respected Harabelle since she had the power to act on her whims. She had the power to roam Waco Mundo with confidence. Well, except for King Berrigan's court. Mila Rose scratched the ground with her paw and leaped a great distance. Don't talk to me like I'm ignorant. I know Harabelle Sama's contempt for sacrificing others. But you are impulsive, like a child. Sun Sun giggled. Harabelle Sama, Wait for us. I'll kill ya, bitch. A fierce lioness chased a snake through the white desert. Harabel soon found the source of the extremely thick riatsu, a hollow, 
roughly the same height as hers, facing a giant ajuchus. His riatsu was stronger than her, not by much. Still it was rare for her to meet a strong hollow outside the boundaries of Lost No Chase. Harabelle glanced at her frozen comrades, who were gripped by primal fear. They showed a similar reaction when she saved them from hollows trying to devour her. Another Vast Lord He was the second Vasto Lord Harabelle encountered in Hueco Mundo, the first being the ever-so-annoying ruler of Hueco Mundo when she became a Vasto Lord a few years ago. He was considerably stronger, which remained true even today. Harabel Sama, Sun Sun paused with a gulp, the hollows Riatsu making her shiver despite their great distance. We should go before he notices us. Mila Rose shook her head and stomped the ground. Arg, another man. He is gonna come after us. Let's ambush him while he is fighting the other hollow. Mila Rose regained her violent bearing once she dealt with her fears. Her suggestion contrasted Sun Sun's peaceful approach. Era? Sun Sun hissed. That hollow has long hair and their face is concealed by a mask. How do you know their gender? Mila Rose stopped momentarily, then scratched her head with her paw. I don't know. I just had a feeling. Gah, look at his figure. If that's not a man, I don't know who is. Sun Sun blinked her eyes. Mila Rose might be onto something, as a hollow's instincts were like a beast. Harabel Sama, I'd advise against engaging in a fight. We might draw more enemies to us. She took on a composed and serious demeanor, contrary to her playful interactions with Mila Rose. Harabel nodded and continued observing the battle. She wasn't at all surprised when the unknown Vasto Lord one-shot the Ajuchas with a Sira Ray. W what? He killed an Ajuchas in one attack? Mila Rose, however, didn't take his prowess lightly. She had seen Harabel cut down Ajuchas like nothing. Fighting another hollow on the same level as Harabel gave her quite the fright. I told you, Mila Rose, Sun Sun whispered. We can't fight him willy nilly. Let us leave before he senses us. Sun Sun nudged Mila Rose's mane with her head before slithering away. Mila Rose listened to Sung Sun's request this time and followed after her. Meanwhile, Harabel watched Kazuya stretch his hand to his companion. Harabel had a few encounters with Apache, but Harabel never contacted her. From Harabel's distant observations, Apache minded her own business and never went out of her way to attack others. This led to Harabel marking Apache as a friend of sorts. I'm relieved she found someone reliable. Harabel gave another glance at Kazuya, who had his back turned against her, showing off his wings. Being Apache's companion meant he wasn't like other hollows in Hueco Mundo, devouring others wasn't his goal. Besides, devouring other souls wasn't optimal at their current level, as Gilion's souls provided little to no improvements to their strength. Sharpening their innate abilities and gathering comrades was more than enough to survive in Hueco Mundo. She craved more strength, but she never wanted it at the cost of other hollows. The male Vasto Lord suddenly turned in her direction. Despite their distance, she could feel his eyes inspecting her from top to bottom. Harabel retracted her gaze from eyes with bottomless depths and shook her head. There is no point in staying here. Hollows didn't dream. Their mind merely cycled through the memories of their soul, their most dominant soul, to be precise. The fabricated phantasms could also be called an artificial dream. In her false dreams, Harabel regularly bore witness to a blurry white room where metal screeched and sparked, blinding lights flickering everywhere. Figures with white heads incited panic in their hypnotizing whispers. Then an innocent cry rumbled through, shattering the reality itself until a void remained. Waves and waves of an infant sobs chipped away at Harabel's soul, carving out her innards and crushing her heart. A pair of white eyes welled up with moisture and oozed a trail of crimson tears until the chilling red painted her vision. Harabel could instinctively feel the suffering behind each tear. Harabel opened her eyes on a slope, with her hand on her left knee and her right knee folded. She showed no signs of discomfort, as though she forgot every experience inside her false dream. That was precisely the case. Her oozing sympathy and regret had receded back into her soul after she woke up. 
she could never truly recall the experience of her past life, the experience she once had as a mother. Haribelt suddenly raised her head. Shrill screams echoed through the dreadful vistas of Hueco Mundo. It echoed as though it came from far away, bouncing off of the nearby hills. Grains of ash-white sands moved in waves as Mila Rose and Sung Sun woke up from their brief slumber. Sung bitch, did you hear that? Era, don't be vulgar. And yes, I did. Someone probably ticked off a pack of Minos Grande. Could it be that male hollow? Mila Rose's mind immediately went to the terrifying hollow they encountered. As should we leave? Why would he disturb Minos Grande? The world doesn't revolve around him. Sun Sun squinted her eyes. Why do you keep bringing him up? Did you, by any chance, get a crush on him? Mila Rose was always a worshipper of strength, her past playing a big role to make her envy the strong. It wouldn't be far-fetched to think Mila Rose would get feelings for a much stronger hollow. Stop talking gibberish. Mila Rose turned her head with a harumph. I just thought he would be linked to this incident. He seemed like the troublesome type. You certainly know him more than us. Haribel closed her eyes. Her companions hearing the howls revealed a glaring detail the conflict was closer this time around. She also sensed Apache's Riatsu flaring up alongside her wing companion's Riatsu. They can take care of each other. She ignored the howls and hung her head for another session of light sleep, as if her subconscious yearned to relive the nightmare again and again. Just a few minutes later, Haribel got up with a jolt. A spine-chilling wail reverberated as an intense riatsu declared its position, rising with each moment. The pressure was so thick it nearly choked her ajuchas comrades. Then the pressure disappeared entirely, leaving her party in a state of confusion. Haribel glanced at her friends. Head back to the base. I'll go check it out. Before Sun Sun and Mila said a word, Haribel leaped into the air and dashed. A boom resounded as Haribel reappeared several feet away. A series of successive sonic bursts rumbled as she made a quick dash for the origin of excruciating howls. Another shriek came and died before she reached her destination. What she saw left her petrified. A giant bird-like hollow screeched as he tried to cover his face with his wings. Dark Riatsu overflowed from his entire being and pushed the ash sand around him. His Riatsu surpassed the limits of an Ajuchas, faintly touching upon the realm of Vasto Lord. His Riatsu rampaged more before slowly receding into his soul. Vasto Lord. Ajuchas. Jillian. His Riatsu sank rapidly then disappeared entirely. The hollow collapsed to his knees, and a gust of wind scattered his husk of a body into ashes. Chapter 10 A Proposal Kazuya's experiment unfolded as anticipated. The three Ajuchas' transformation into Erinkar culminated in disaster and their demise, a disheartening yet logical outcome. Expecting unnamed NPCs to subdue their primal instincts and then seal them into a weapon was just begging for disappointment. What he hadn't foreseen was Haribel's arrival, her attention piqued by the explosive surge in Riatsu. Nonetheless, he remained unfazed by her current formidable appearance. A vast O Lord. Her Riatsu is weaker than me? It seemed she had achieved her vast O Lord rank not long ago. Otherwise, her Riatsu would surpass his by a big margin. Putting on his most charming grin, he threw out a friendly wave. Bonjour, Mademoiselle. Pardon me for disturbing your rest. In the presence of a withering hollow, his formal greeting looked sinister. His melodious voice, like a choir of angelic bells, didn't help his case either. His presence screamed red flags, but Haribel, caught in Ajucha's deaths, failed to recognize any. What happened to these hollows? They attacked us out of nowhere. When they couldn't beat me, they started tearing their masks. He rubbed the back of his head with a feigned, helpless smile. The rest is history. Why would a hollow tear their mask? Haribel wasn't swayed by his sweet voice and posed a valid question. She turned to Apache, who seemed on edge. Is that what happened? Her distrust in Kazuya and trust in Apache couldn't be more obvious. 
she'd rather believe Apache whom she had observed for some time than believing a complete stranger. Faced with Harabelle's question, Apache found herself stuck between a rock and a hard place. Kazuya lied to Harabelle without so much of a flinch as he was responsible for cracking the three Ajucha's masks with his fists. He did it without a change in his expression as if all the pleading those Ajuchas meant nothing to him. He was ruthless and vicious like a devil, resembling the hollows who wanted to devour her. Her first impression of him couldn't have been farther from his true face. She also understood the essence of his experiments, using others like a fodder to test the success of Aaron Karazation. Are you willing to do anything for power? Stealing a glance at him, she noticed his neutral lips but gleaming eyes, urging her to act. He wanted her to take a stance, either lie for him or betray him and side with Haribel. The decision might dictate her life from here on out. This jerk! She gritted her teeth, frustrated at his obvious attempt to back her into a corner. Yes. They lost their minds to find a vast lord nearly as powerful as their master, King Berrigan. Reading Haribel's intention was much easier than predicting the intricate schemes brewing inside behind his sinister mind. In spite of it all, she refused to betray him. He had saved her life and helped her in recovering her Ryoku. While she wouldn't say it out loud, the past day had been the most fun she had in her lonely life. Getting Apache's confirmation, Haribel didn't push the matter any further and regarded Kazuya with a composed gaze. King Berrigan sees all vast O-Lord as a threat to his authority. He will come after us, eventually to recruit us into his Espada ranks. You two should keep moving, stay away from Berrigan's lackeys. Berrigan saw all of Hueco Mundo as his playground, everyone a piece for him to use and discard. The Espada under him was just more tools to do his bidding. Haribel, on the other hand, loathed the very thought of sacrificing anyone. Two powerful people with contrasting beliefs were bound to clash, even if she harbored no intentions of challenging his authority. Why should we trust your words? Apache questioned Haribel's goodwill with sharp eyes. Fuck this King Berrigan. Kazuya will slap his head off. Cough. Cough. Kazuya tried not to laugh but ended up coughing. He cleared his throat and rubbed her head. Excuse me, Apache. I'm a day-old vast lord and King Berrigan has been in power for centuries. His army alone can drown me in their spit. By me, I mean us. We live and die together now, Apache. Apache's eyes widened at the thought of an army of Jillian, Ajuchas, and vast lords Her vivid imagination set her head spinning. You're right. You're so hot-headed. The quote, think before act, is to teach impulsive hollows like you. He sighed and smiled at Haribel. King Berrigan will blame me for his subordinates' deaths. I don't think I can fight him and his loonies by my lonesome. What should I do? How do I protect Apache now? His aspect of death simply wasn't efficient enough to fight Berrigan at this stage. Besides, he needed an excuse to invade Haribel's group and slowly bring them to his side. Did he actually took King Berrigan as a threat, though? Absolutely not. He always had the option of jumping to the living world and changing his race to human or going to soul society as a normal soul and hiding among weak souls like a little bitch. The vast amount of choices didn't leave threats in Hueco Mundo. Except for Aizen who was fated to take over Hueco Mundo. Fuck Aizen. Apache's throat produced a low, guttural growl reminiscent of an agitated canine. This manipulative bastard. He is acting helpless now. Haribel's aqua green eyes widened ever so slightly, her gaze fixated on Kazuya. A kaleidoscope of emotions danced within her eyes, each one fleeting and impossible to decipher. She hesitated, then inquired in a soft voice, Did you say you're one day old? Kazuya was momentarily perplexed by Haribel's unexpected question. He glanced at Apache for reassurance before refocusing on Haribel. I am. You can ask Apache. Apache nodded in his support, confirming his lifespan. I found him half buried like a day ago. He didn't even know how to control his Riatsu or that he is a freaking vast o lord. As Apache confirmed Kazuya's statement, Haribel's eyes took on a soft glow. 
You can come with me. His hand flew to cover his gaping jaw. Harabel's open offer dictated two choices, agree or disagree. Yet the spark of hope in her eyes desperately pleaded for him to agree. Even the always calm Kazuya felt a shiver. Harabel's behavior wasn't natural, not by a long shot. She looked way too eager to invite him as if it wasn't their first time meeting. Something was extremely wrong, an unease gnawed at his mind. Yet he couldn't point out the reason for this feeling. She changed after I said I'm one day old. That's extremely S.U.S. Taking a deep breath, he nodded and smiled. The more the merrier, they say. Us weak ones gotta stick together. Apache nearly choked on his ridiculous claim. You and weak, Tui. If you're weak, then everyone in Hueco Mundo is an ant. Little Apache learned to be sarcastic. What a terrifying development. All thanks to you, rascal. All thanks to you. He chuckled and saw Harabel staring at him. I am Kazuya, by the way. This is Apache. What about you? Tear Harabel. That's a unique name if I ever saw one. Mind if I call you Harabel? Harabel shook her head. Follow me. Kazuya and Apache followed Harabel to her base, their footsteps silent like shadows on the moonlit ground. As expected, two Ajuchas were sitting in the cave, staring at him. The snake's slitted eyes flickered with curiosity and amusement, while the lioness growled, openly expressing her hostility. Her reaction was as if Kazuya was the malevolent being that killed her loved ones. Cyan Sun Sun giggled. Oh no, Harabel Sama brought a man home. That's all you have to say? Mila Rose roared at her friend for being too nonchalant. They recently alluded to Kazuya being a bad guy who would attack them on sight. Now he and his companion stood before them as Harabel's guests. Why aren't you asking anything about him? The snake ignored Mila Rose's yells and waved her tail at Kazuya and Apache. Hello there, newcomers. Apache pointed at Sung Sun and Mila Rose with her feet. Hey, it's Harabel's full squad. I'm Apache. Sun Sun's tongue darted out of her mouth for a fleeting second. I'm Cyan Sun Sun. This ill-tempered puppy is Francesca Mila Rose. They got first and last names? Apache whispered to Kazuya. We're the only ones without it. Sorry, it's just you. Kazuya smiled at Sun Sun. I'm Kazuya Ishihara. Sun Sun nodded, eyes crinkling as though she was pleased. Your voice is soothing. You'll be an excellent singer or storyteller. I don't have memories to derive any story from, he said with a sigh, fully taking the role of an adolescent. He could feel an oppressive air settling in the cave, so he laughed. I have a few amusing tales about Apache. Would you be interested? I'd love to hear them. Don't sell me out. Apache cut in with a fiery retort. Wait. I don't have any embarrassing moments. Do I? He crossed his arms and grinned. You just made one. Sun Sun laughed. You fell for it. Harabel watched over the three with a stern look. Kazuya and Apache meshed well with Sun Sun. Then again, Sun Sun was cunning enough to act friendly to anyone regardless of their personality. Meanwhile, Mila Rose blinked her eyes as the rest of the party interacted like they were old acquaintances. The new members adapted to their group like they belonged there, while she felt like a complete outcast as if she was a fish out of water. She despised this feeling. Kazuya glanced at Mila Rose, clearly understanding the reason for her silence. He disturbed their group dynamic with his presence. If I make you anxious, should I leave? Mila Rose stared at him in barely concealed surprise. The one who hadn't forgotten her was also the source of her chaotic emotions. His polite apology certainly caught her by surprise, its effect further enhanced by his soft voice. Mila Rose released a tame roar before looking away. I'm not berating Harabel Sama's decision. She won't do anything that will harm us. Kazuya responded with a nod and a soft smile. Mila Rose seemed like another Tsundera Hollow, but with more ferocity than Apache. I legit forgot she existed, Sun Sun whispered. 
Jeeves, Mila Rose. Be more refined. Let's start with a simple introduction. I introduction? Mila Rose stuttered for a second and sat down like an obedient puppy. I'm Francesca Mila Rose. My hobbies are tearing hollows and kicking heads around. I also like sharpening my claws. Her introduction left everyone speechless. Mila Rose's gaze drifted from face to face as she wondered about the effectiveness of her introduction. He clapped with an innocent smile, breaking the silence. That was wonderful. Chapter 11 Training Kazuya spent some time chatting with his party. Haribel then motioned for them to follow her. They soon stepped out of the cramped cave, which had been narrow to fit everyone without it feeling cramped. He preferred it this way as it also helped Mila Rose and Sung Sun slowly become used to his and Apache's presence. Haribel turned around to leave. I'll inform you when we leave. Until then. He reached out and grabbed her hand. I have a request. Can you help me with my training? Training? Haribel readily asked. What type of training? What skills do I need in Hueco Mundo? Haribel's eyes turned soft. Fight, right now? I'll ask you later. He had to address Apache's concerns first. As soon as Haribel left, Apache glared at him for obvious reasons. He had put her into a dilemma and made her lie. Now was the time to reward her. You forced, gah. A pace nearly choked when Kazuya hugged her neck, squeezing the deer for her dear life. Thanks for having my back. Not expecting words of gratitude, a pace stood there like an idiot until he drew back from her. Did you rip their masks to transform them into Aaron Carr? I did, and the results were just as I expected. Also, don't feel bad for them. They came to kill us, remember? All three hollows ended up burning their souls, temporarily showing Ryatsu a Vasto Lord class. He had a sudden idea. The unnamed NPCs couldn't endure the demanding process of Aaron Karization, but Apache was a different breed. She was a named character with her own role to play in the massive war caused by Aizen. The chances of Apache succeeding were enormous. Apache shivered as his intent locked on her. What are you thinking now? I feel hungry. Can I grill your leg? No! He decided to ditch the risky idea. The 1% chance of Apache dying or being inflicted with amnesia like Neelial was simply unacceptable. I'm getting way too obsessed with this Aaron Carr shit. He shook his head and decided to relax for the day. Sometime later, Kazuya strolled across the rocky terrain of Hueco Mundo until he came face to face with Haribel. On the cliff in the distance were Mila Rose, Sun Sun, and Apache, their shadows falling long and dark in the twilight sky. All three Ajuchas watched, fascinated, as the two Vasto lords silently sized each other up. Haribel made eye contact with him. Before we start, let me ask you something. Why do you want to become strong? Why do you want to fight? Everyone needed a reason to seek strength, whether it was for survival, a sense of accomplishment, or simply to tyrannize the weak. Haribel was determined to have strength for a meaningful purpose, to avoid meaningless fights. She wanted to become strong in body and spirit, gaining her control over her own animalistic desires. She had another dream, one that couldn't be fulfilled in the near future. Kazuya smiled at her question. For my survival and to protect Apache. That's all I have on my mind right now. He wasn't obsessed with fighting, neither did he need to become powerful to kill mindlessly. His only wish was a life free from control. This training was a necessary step in assuring his freedom and survival. Haribel gave him a cursory nod, finding his reason appropriate for a hollow of his age. I'll test you first. I'll perform really bad. He gave an elegant bow, showing manners rooted in him by his grandfather. Please take care of me. He never got into any brawl. His closest experience to a fight was during the self-defense lessons. This would be his first rodeo. Saying he wasn't a little nervous would be a lie. It's fine. Haribel gave a single, sharp nod and her powerful Riazza shot out, wrapping around him with an invisible grip. 
It was sharper than a blade, giving him a sense of danger. In an instant she was gone, replaced by a silver flash and the distant hum of her sonido. Then she was in front of him, her sword arm howling through the air. His skin broke out in cold sweat and his heart raced in his chest. In a split second, he shifted his body weight and used the technique of sonido. His body disappeared with a loud swoosh followed by a giant cloud of sand as her sword missed its mark and slammed into the ground, sending sand cascading outward in concentric circles. The attack could have sliced him in half, the realization made him gulp. This isn't training, Harabel. You're straight up trying to kill me. It will only scratch your thick bones, Harabel said in a neutral tone. Physical injuries without Riatsu heal faster in Hueco Muno's rich racer. He glanced at the aftermath of her attack. Yeah, right. I totally believe you. Can we do it without inflicting injuries? He wasn't ready to test his regeneration skills so soon. Especially not by getting his body crushed by her sword. Harabel shook her head. You have to teach your body, or else it'll not be ready when the moment comes. While the fear of death was necessary to push into his limits, the fear could work against him in dangerous situations. He might abandon those he wished to protect. Harabel Sama, he is inexperienced. Sun Sun shouted. You should start with basic things like when to defend and when to attack. Sung Sun gave Harabel directions to help Kazuya with Harabel's inflexible demeanor. A vast o lord who can't fight properly. It's quite an adorable sight. Even I can knock him out, Mila Rose spoke, but no one paid her any attention. Fuckers. Ha ha ha. Apache wasn't so considerate. Throwing her head around, she let out a carefree giggle. His face is so hilarious. Her laughter was loud enough to reach him, prompting him to glare at her in return. I'll take care of her later. And no, I was kidding. Apache shivered and settled down. Sun Sun and Mila Rose chuckled at her timid response. Harabel frowned. Gaining experience through battles is the best training for you. Kazuya knew the importance of her advice. He could brute force weaker hollows with his Riatsu only, the same method wouldn't work with another vast o lord or stronger opponents. A novice like him needed to invest both time and effort to get better. If he lost against another vast o lord, it would be due to his lacking skills. Skill issue, fuck. He clapped his cheeks and clenched his fists. No pain, no gain. Come. Let's start. Harabel pounced at him without hesitation. The sound of rending air reached his ears, her sword arm once again came crashing down on him. She was fast, but he was also a vast o lord, both in body and senses. Stepping to the side of her attack, he saw her vulnerable after her wide attack. Found an opening. He raised his leg to kick her undefended side. Goosebumps suddenly crawled on his skin, signaling danger. Another strike was coming. A frontal kick to his midsection at tremendous speed. Half. He leaped in the air without another thought. Swish. Harabel's kick rent the air, he dodged a fatal kick to his chest and landed on a boulder. Pure adrenaline pumped through him, a surge of energy rolling through him in waves. The training had barely started, but he was feeling its rush. Harabel reached him instantaneously with Sonido and swung her arm with brute force. He barely ducked to dodge. Yet, her arm changed its course and took his knees out from under him. Next thing he knew, he was kissing the ashen sand. Keep your eyes open and sharp, Harabel said calmly as she kneeled before him and ruffled his hair. Don't expect your enemy to fight with honor, the survivor is the winner. It's the unwritten law of Hueco Mundo. Kazuya pushed himself up and spat the sand out. Despite the ridiculous impact, the pain was non-existent. He looked up at Harabel. Her soft gaze lacked any arrogance or negative emotions, for that matter. She looked like a teacher fully committed to coaching him to the very end. No, he felt like her gaze was more akin to a mother teaching a newborn. She radiated that type of aura. You're gonna drive me nuts. Harabel almost felt compelled to leave him alone and happy. She firmly shook her head, 
resisting her impulses. I can't. I can't stop. I lack the strength to protect him from Berrigan. We both have to grow. Clenching her fists, she told him to have a brief rest before continuing the training. She didn't use lethal force afterwards, and he could mostly keep up with her flurry of attacks. He continued trading blows with her, adapting his body to her movements and expanding his combat knowledge. Chapter 12 Changes The open court of Las Noches was under the roof as its ruler had claimed all the land under Hueco Mundo's sky as his domain. To earn his title, he had bested every vast O Lord of his era. Those who sought to defeat him died, and those who feared him became his war assets, namely the Espada. He currently sat upon his throne with a regal air, draped in an ethereal, navy blue robe. A crown of gold adorned his skull head. He was a hollow very reminiscent of a lich, the pinnacle of undead as known by many. His throne was upon a pedestal, and his followers' subjects kneeled on either side of the red carpet. Everyone in his court belonged to the Ajuchas tier or above. The hollow lady serving him drinks from behind was a vast lord. A powerful vast lord who chose to submit her entire being to him once he beat her. King Berrigan, the god-king of Hueco Mundo, the ruler of Las Noches. He was no mere hollow. Achieving the realm of Vasto Lord and then breaking his mask, he had become one of the most fearsome being within Hueco Mundo. Bearing the aspect of death's senescence, he could decay and age any life around him at will. He lacked nothing in Hueco Mundo. He had everything. Nothing in Hueco Mundo interested him anymore. The monotony of such a life left him bored enough that he pondered over dividing his army into two factions and starting a war between them. It was at that moment a muscular ajuchas ran up the red carpet. My lord, two wandering Vasto lord are killing our comrades. Two Vasto lord, whispered Berrigan before holding out a hand. Summon them to the court. Wait, send Espada to fetch them. Berrigab Lizenbaron considered every Vasto lord beneath him except for the primordial hollow. But two Vasto lord would prove to be a headache for his subordinates. Thus, he sent troops from the strongest army under him. The Espada. Yes, my lord. It shall be done. Keeping track of time was impossible in Hueco Mundo. Kazuya felt like it had been a month since he became a hollow. In that unknown period of time, quite a few changes happened. Most noticeable one was in the hollows of his party, mainly Apache, Mila Rose, and Sun Sun. Their Ryurioku level steadily grew. Apache's growth was the most impressive of them all. Her Riatsu had become thicker and denser, reaching the levels of the first Ajuchas Kazuya killed. All thanks to his generosity to provide her with a steady stream of Jillians and occasionally Ajuchas. His innate ability crumbling heart could also be held responsible for their growth. The second change was in Kazuya himself. Day by day, his mind and muscles became more attuned to battles. Haribel also gave immense help with honing his natural abilities. With every battle fought, he became an increasingly tougher opponent for Haribel. She also grew stronger after sparring with someone who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her. She could go all out against him, letting her experiment with new techniques and styles. It was a win-win situation for both of them. Last one was a lack of response from Berrigan after he killed three Ajuchas in Berrigan's service. He was even ready for a visit from Berrigan himself, yet nothing of sorts happened. It made him question if Aizen already transformed Berrigan into an Erenkar with the Hogyoku. In a conundrum, he sought counsel from the wisest of his companions, Sun Sun. He asked solemnly while she studied him with her beady eyes. Then suddenly, she threw her head back and released a cheery laugh. The earrings dangling from her ears swayed in rhythm with her joyous outburst. You're naive to think King Berrigan can wipe every one of his subordinates asses. I overestimated him, huh? He overrated the structure within the current Lost No Chase. Berrigan never left his court, and his most loyal subordinates rarely left his side. Naturally, there would be a massive delay in recognizing the missing Ajuchas and more delay in investigating their cause of death. Yep. Hueco Mundo is huge, and hollows die every day in every corner of its land. 
he can't account for every ajuchas under him. They might have eaten each other for all he knows. Sun Sun coiled her tail around his waist and caressed his neck with the tip of her tail. All I'm saying is, relax. King Berrigan won't know how and where his subordinates died. He shrugged. Got it. Sun Sun's tongue flicked in and out as she stared at him. You look disappointed. I expected Berrigan to send some competent stepping stones for me to test my strength. Talk about confidence. Sun Sun giggled. What if Berrigan didn't send anyone and came himself? What would you do? I'd run the fuck away, with all of you, of course. She couldn't help but laugh at his adorable response. Keep that mentality, and you'd live a long life in Hueco Mundo. I mean every word I said. Listen, today's defeat can be converted into a victory tomorrow. Today's death can only be converted into sorrow and tears. Sun Sun had thought a long time to string together a wise quote to stop her group from taking a wrong step. She wanted everyone to live, for a long time. He shook his head. I'd take a fun life over a long life any day of the week. On paper, his previous life was great, if not perfect. Did he enjoy it? Not much. That's. I can't help but agree with you, Sun Sun admitted with a sigh. But we, Hollows, are confined to our fate. There isn't much we can do in the way of having fun. Why not go for long lives? He gently extended his hand and touched the snake's head. The cold, scaly texture of the seashell mask fused to her head made him flinch. Her eyes showed confusion as they glanced this way and that, blinking softly in the dim light. I'll teach you how to have fun. It's my promise, okay? You treating me like a child might be the most absurd thing that ever happened to me. He chuckled and drew back his hand. I'll do it again if you look depressed. She had massively helped him in adapting to Harabelle's training. She was the reason Harabelle didn't go full hardcore from the start and took strides in guiding him through different levels of skills. Note to self, don't look depressed in front of Kazuya. Won't work, madam. I tend to bring out the worst in people around me. Just look at Apache. The mention of Apache made Sun Sun giggle. Over the past few weeks, Sun Sun and Kazuya made Apache's life lively by constantly teasing her and making pranks on her. Hearing distinct footsteps, he looked over his shoulder. Speak of the devil. Apache entered the cave, glaring at him with fire in her eyes. What are you two plotting now? I take the fifth on that. Me too. Fuck you, Sun Sun, Apache muttered under her breath and strode out of the cave. Sun Sun shook her head. She got angry, or jealous. She'll be back to her flame-spitting form by tomorrow. He nudged Sun Sun before leaving the cave. He spotted Haribel sitting alone on a hill and joined her. Here for a breather? Chapter 13, Unforeseen Haribel's gaze drifted up, her brow furrowed in contemplation as she studied the pale, round orb of the moon. She shook her head gently. I was reflecting on your growth and thinking about new things to teach you. She was really invested in her role as his mentor, to the point of obsession. This very obsession pushed him to delay his plan of seducing her, that and the fact both of them had yet to become an Arankar. He felt weirdly turned off by the notion of having sex in his current body, even if both of them looked mostly humanoid. Guess I am not into monster sex. It wasn't a bad thing per se, as even Haribel, the closest to having a humanoid form, had most of her body covered in hollow fragments. He rested his head on Haribel's thighs, looking utterly comfortable in his action. The white shell covering her legs was cool and soft to touch. I'll be here while you wreck your brain for ideas. He had been on the receiving end of some lap pillows after she wrecked him in training. She also loved showering him in care after beating the hell out of him. Kazuya closed his eyes, trying to maintain a steady breath as if he was sleeping. Haribel let out a soft sigh, and her fingers glided through his disheveled, white hair with a light touch. He sneakily opened his right eye and saw a tender look in her eyes. It was all the confirmation he needed. I was right about her. In the month they spent together, 
he noticed many abnormalities, the way she always came up with things to teach him, the way her protective nature materialized every time he faced a hollow, the way her eyes softened when she looked at him, and the way she never let him out of her sight for a long time. All the signs pointed to Harabelle loving him, like a sister loved her brother, or a mother loved her child. Familial love. That was why Harabelle's demeanor shifted when he mentioned his age as a hollow. A young one like him would be the perfect person to pamper and spoil. She subconsciously chose him as the target of her nurturing. It all made sense when taking her hollow hole's placement into consideration. Her hollow hole is where her womb should be. Harabelle's death was most likely related to a child. Her instincts unconsciously sought a replacement for her missing child, and then she found him. Family zoned by a hollow. The situation was so absurd that he didn't know whether to laugh or cry. It was truly one of the experiences of all time. What am I supposed to do now? Call her mommy? Shark mommy? He shook his head. There were more important tasks to fulfill than romancing Harabelle, such as increasing his strength and starting the evolution chain of his other races. Berrigan will come after us, eventually. Berrigan was a slave to his arrogance, expecting everyone in Hueco Mundo to view him as God-King. He wouldn't allow too vast a lord to roam around unshackled, which would be akin to challenging his authority. Kaziel was bound to stick out on Berrigan's radar at some point. He needed strength if he hoped to survive Berrigan's wrath. After all, no short-term training could help him defeat Berrigan and his army. The only other choice I have is Shinigami Academy, the den of hypnotized souls and its secret ruler Aizen. It'll be fun stirring the assholes there. Aizen would be everywhere until he gets sit down by his own creation. Leaving also meant it was time to say farewell to Haribel, Apache, Sung Sun, and Mila Rose. A temporary farewell but a farewell, nevertheless. He had gotten too used to teaming up with Sung Sun, the two of them trying to tease Apache into a miserable state. Mila Rose still hadn't opened up to him, holding a grudge against him for destroying their group dynamic. Yet he had a strange fondness for her grumpy whining more than he did for any of the anonymous hollows they encountered in Hueco Mundo. He was going to miss them. I wish I could take them away from this hellhole. But his dream couldn't come true. Not with the soul reapers harboring deep prejudice for every hollow. They saw hollow as lost souls to be purified in the afterlife. He couldn't blame them either, as most hollows live to devour the souls of innocents. Let's delay it until I help them get strong enough to survive. You, what do we have here? Mila Rose strode up to them in a haughty demeanor. Seeing that Kazuya was asleep, she heaved a sigh of relief. Haribel Sama, you're pampering him too much. Haribel looked at Mila Rose and back at Kazuya before drawing her hand back. Rose is right, but I can't resist it. It was like her instinct to spoil Kazuya, like a Julian's instinct was to devour other hollows, or a bird's instinct was to soar into the sky with its wings. It's fine, she smiled gently. Kazuya needs to rest, or his training will bear no fruit. She justified her instincts, wholeheartedly believing her behavior of spoiling Kazuya was the right way. Oh, Mila Rose's head drooped and her body sagged as she lowered herself to the ground. Haribel's matter-of-fact response was like a gust of wind, blowing away her courage. After a few minutes of pretending, Kazuya stirred and got to his feet. He gave Mila Rose a surprised look. When did you arrive? Been here before you were born, Mila Rose whispered. Haribel Sama saved me before all of you. His presence had become a negative influence in Mila Rose's life. She was unable to voice her discontent because of her unwavering loyalty to Haribel. I have to address her before it's too late. He stretched his arm and beckoned Mila Rose. Come with me. We need to talk. Haribel sharply narrowed her eyes, realizing his intentions. Don't push her too much. Being the quiet, observant leader, she understood Mila Rose's problem with Kazuya. She looked forward to Kazuya's way of handling Mila Rose. From her observations, Kazuya wasn't rash, but he also wasn't kind towards strangers. While she spared those who obstructed her path, he mercilessly killed them and fed them to Apache, and sometimes Mila Rose, 
and Sung's son. It'll be an excellent lesson for him, thought Haribel, like a mother watching her child's growth. I expect him to get to her, eventually. He was too stubborn to admit defeat. Mila Rose gritted her teeth. The way Haribel worded things, it seemed as if she was the problem here. She didn't like this feeling. Not one bit. Even so, she followed Kazuya like a pup, each step taking them further away from Haribel. When he was sure they were beyond Haribel's sight, he stopped and turned to face her. Francesca Mila Rose, are you a coward? Chapter 14, Cure for Prejudice Francesca Mila Rose, are you a coward? Kazuya's voice was soothing, yet his words were rage-inducing. Coward? Mila Rose roared fiercely, faint yellow Riatsu flickering around her. The lioness's strongest show of Riatsu couldn't intimidate him in the slightest. Who are you calling a coward? I have been chewing hollows for longer than you. Weird thing to be proud of. He shrugged. Well, chewing bones doesn't stop you from being a coward. Only a coward would keep their thoughts contained for that long, he said slowly, his eyes piercing into her soul. You have a problem with me, don't you? Say it to my face if you aren't a coward. Mila Rose scowled. I don't have a problem with you. You are the problem looming over us. You don't have to repeat what I just said. I want to know your reasoning for labeling me the problem. Every phenomenon in this universe has a reason. Your hatred should have one too. It's because, Mila Rose paused and looked around. After making sure nobody was eavesdropping, she glared at him, eyes glowing menacingly. Haribel Sama is putting so much effort into training you. She will make you strong, stronger than herself. And? You will betray us, she growled. All male hollows are scum. You'll kill Haribel Sama, me, and Sun Sun, and eat us. I have seen that happen so many times. Men are disloyal, backstabbing pieces of shit. The pack she belonged to was torn apart because of a man's megalomaniacal tendencies and the resulting internal strife. She would have been a casualty if not for Haribel's timely rescue. In her eyes, Kazuya had all the markings of the man who caused her former pack to go up in ashes even though their personalities were worlds apart from each other. She didn't have an ounce of trust in him. Kazuya expected some intricate reasoning behind her hatred. However, what he heard left him baffled. Mila Rose seems like one of those women who develop a profound detestation for all men after suffering one heartbreak. Perhaps this was her condition before she passed away and her soul became the dominant one in a juches. Gosh, you're so strange. My image in your mind is that of an ambitious man who would destroy everything to gain strength. Right? He was a bit twisted, but he wasn't a psychopath without empathy. Mila Rose's image couldn't be further from the truth. After all, he adored all four of his hollow friends. Mila Rose nodded unconsciously, wondering how he read her mind so precisely. Yeah. Taking a deep breath, he looked her squarely in the eyes. Tell me one thing I did to deserve this assessment? Go on. Take as much time as you need. He crossed his arms, tapping his left feet as if showing he was waiting. That's easy, Mila Rose paused, finding herself at a loss of words. After all, she couldn't find anything tangible to fire back at him, no matter how much she thought. He had been quietly supportive like Haribel. None of his actions so far resembled the evil man in her mind, causing her fantasy to crumble like a poorly constructed house of cards. I was wrong. A tide of embarrassment swept over her upon recognizing her error. The confrontation brought about an end to her clouded perspective, which was obscured by the haze of bygone tragedy. She averted her gaze from his solemn eyes, looking remorseful for her immature judgment. I'm sorry. She was quick to apologize as well, playing into her headstrong and quick-to-take-action archetype in his head. Mila rose. He raised his hand, index finger extended, sky-blue Riatsu enveloping his hand. Just when she thought he'd slap her as a punishment, he surprised her with a lightning-fast flick on her chin. The attack wasn't vicious as Mila Rose expected. It still made her wince. That was your punishment. 
We're even now, he said, his voice low and calming. He reached up and stroked her mane. I know there are terrible people out there, but their gender doesn't define who they are. There are just as many evil bitches out there as there are wicked men. His face was a mask of compassion and understanding as he brought her astray from the path of sexism. She nodded, listening to him as if his words were the profound truth of the world. He smirked. But then again, I don't care what you think about others. They can burn in hell for all I care. He let his fingers linger, massaging her mane before trailing down to her ears in a gentle caress. Stepping back, he smiled at her with a look of contentment. He cured her deep sexism with little effort. The achievement was worthy of celebration on its own. My voice is so unfair against these naive girls. He couldn't wait for the day his hollow friends achieved the Aaron Carr stage and became humanoid. The day he would finalize his plans to take them. Is this considered grooming? Hmm. Who cares? Mila Rose veered over and hit his leg with her head. I'll keep an eye on you. You're going to stalk me? It's creepy. You wish. I will do it to make sure Haribel Sama is safe from you. Funny you say that. I'm worried Haribel might do something to me before I do anything to her. Mila Rose recalled Haribel's extreme ways to train him. Haribel's interest in him bordered the lines of obsession. She felt like the chances of his words being true were higher than Haribel's suffering at his hands. It was another aspect she had missed in her one-sided hate for Kazuya. T then I will make sure to keep you safe from Haribel Sama. Aw. Oh. I'm melting from your consideration. Why do you have to act so annoying? Because it pleases me? Does it? Suddenly, a hollow emanating a dangerous Riatsu entered his perception. Mila Rose involuntarily shuddered, the terror of a powerful Vasto lord coursing through her. We have a guest, he whispered, eyeing rapidly flying towards them in a blur. A powerful one. The hollow landed on a mountain before him and their appearance became clearer. His mouth hung open in surprise. The hollow was a striking sight in the darkness, a young woman with short, curly purple twin tails and eyes of the same color. Her frilly dress clung to her body, its large puffy sleeves cutting off just above her shoulders, and two short wings extended from her back. The wings were a part of her dress. She had paired her outfit with opera gloves, knee-high boots, and leg warmers connected to garters at her thighs. A light purple teardrop marking painted onto each of her cheeks, violet lipstick, and black fingernails completed her voluminous goth Lolita look. She was quite literally the embodiment of gothic Lolita in Japanese fashion. Kazuya's brows twitched. Fuck me. Berrigan sent an Erencar after us. She was what Kazuya strived to be in Erencar. The remnant of her hollow form was a spiked hairpin. He wondered about his own Erencar form. How would he look and what shape will his Zampakudo take? The woman's eyes widened before she nodded to herself. Knowing about Aaron Cars won't change your fate. Number 5 Espada, Surachi Sanderwichi is here to collect you and your friend Vasto Lord. A smirk stretched across her face as she reached behind her and pulled out a long whip with a large metal disc attached to it. Her look of haughtiness was almost intimidating as she casually swung the whip, its tip slicing through the air with a sharp crack. Bring the other Vasto Lord, boy, she said in a mocking tone. Or not, it doesn't matter to me. I enjoy watching pathetic losers try to resist me. That always gives me an excuse to teach them a lesson with my whip. Ah! Berrigan just had to send a sadistic one to fetch him. Chapter 15 A Real Challenge Sirachi Sanderwichi, current number 5 Espada, under the reign of Berrigan Lisenberg. While not yet empowered by Aizen Togyoku, her natural prowess as an Erencar made her a force to be reckoned with. Her Zampakudo, Galandrina, was a sight to behold. It was a whip in her hand, a giant golden disc-like blade attached to the end. A formidable Zampakudo that covered both melee and long range. Kazuyan never thought his first real opponent would be a woman, much less one with the attitude of a pissed-off alley cat. He saw Mila Rose trembling with fear and flicked her mask. Kitten, 
Get off your ass and go to Haribo. Tell her not to interfere with the battle. After honing his racial abilities and aspect of death for a month in a training montage worthy of a shounen anime, he felt ready to take on a foe of Sorechi's caliber. General Information Name, Kazuya Ishihara Gender, Male Race, Hollow, Vasto Lord Ryurioka Level, Great Level, Captain Class Alignment, Neutral Evil Affiliation, None Racial Abilities Siro, Ryurioku Offensive Technique Mastery Level, High Sonido, Movement Technique Mastery Level, High Garganta, Limited Spatial Distortion Technique Mastery Level, Basic Innate Abilities Silvery Voice, Your Voice Can Influence People's State of Mind the ability works best in persuading or seducing someone. Oppression, aspect of death, the materialization of your hollow heart. Crumbling heart, hollow living beings classified as hollow receive nourishment and enhancements. Regeneration, your wounds regenerate automatically. The time required depends on the severity of the wounds. Acquired abilities. Seduction, the ability to seduce those of the opposite gender. Mastery Level Intermediate Writing, the ability to write a mount. Mastery Level Intermediate Arithmetic, the ability to process arithmetic problems. Mastery Level Intermediate Provocation, the ability to anger people with your tongue. Mastery Level Basic Equipment His status reinforced his confidence. Mila Rose didn't share his positive outlook of the situation. You'll go up against her alone? She'll tear you apart. It'll be an honorable death then, he said with a warm smile that crinkled his eyes behind his mask. He reached out and gently patted her head before straightening up to his full height. Hurry before she targets you. No friggin' way. I don't abandon my people. I'll stay and fight. Aw. Oh. It's so nice of you to finally acknowledge me as your own. But you're dishonoring me now. I said I want a solo fight with her. Mila Rose stared at him for a long second before she turned around and made a run for Haribel, clearly not buying into his solo fight request. Surachi glanced at Mila Rose, but he stepped in to hide the lioness from her view. Hollow lady, you have the most punchable face I have seen on a woman. Care to share your secret? Surachi's face twisted. You lowly life form. I'll add five whips to treat your insolence. She had an unshakable belief in her strength, so much so that she didn't take Kazuya as an actual threat. Well, Kazuya suppressing his Ryatsu also contributed to her inflated ego. He wasn't about to expose the full extent of his power level to every Tom, Dick, and Harry Hollow. He had to be deliberate about attracting unwanted attention from some mega powerful Hollow of this era. He observed the battlefield. Surachi was seething, but not making any move. I'll go first. Kazuya wasted no time and activated his Sonido skill in a heartbeat. With a resounding boom, he bridged the gap between them with electrifying speed and unleashed a devastating kick to Surachi's midsection. The sheer force of the blow propelled her like a comet through the mountainside. A cacophony of crumbling rock and shattering earth erupted as dust and debris rained down. The air was thick with the haze of destruction, a testament to the raw power that had just been unleashed. She is so hard, he muttered, feeling like he kicked a wall of iron. Aaron cars and their bullshit defense. Definitely not envious. As the dust swirled and danced in the aftermath of the impact, Surachi's massive disc emerged from the haze. The lethal weapon tore through the air, honing in on Kazuya's skull with a furious velocity. It was a blazingly fast attack, yet it paled in comparison to the ferocious onslaught that Haribel had unleashed during their training sessions. With a deft twist of his body, Kazuya evaded the golden disc by a hair's breadth, narrowly escaping the jaws of death. As he darted away, her Zampakudo found a new target in the unsuspecting hillside mere feet from his previous position. The disc collided with the earth, carving a path of destruction as it plowed through the dirt, pulverizing stones and scattering them in its wake. 
saw it burst forth in every direction, a torrent of shrapnel borne from the ferocity of Sarechi's relentless assault. The landscape trembled, changed by the brutal dance of battle. This is her sealed state. He could only imagine the destruction Sarechi could cause in her resurrection state, the technique which allowed Arankars to access all of their hollow powers. Sarechi emerged from the dissipating dust cloud, holding her whip as the disc spun endlessly. Do you not know that Iero hardens in Arankar's skin? Give it your all if you want to hurt me physically. As an Ajucha's Arankar, her base Ryatsu was some levels below a Vasto Lord. Her Iero still allowed her to defend his physical attack. I do love a woman who can take punishment. Hey, how about you and I? What do Hollows say when they want to court a woman? Care to show me the ropes as the older, more experienced one? Sirachi's face turned red. The hell is wrong with you? I'd never court an asshole like you. Bummer. Chapter 16 A Real Challenge Sirachi pounced at Kazuya like a ravenous predator. With a swift and ferocious swing of her whip, she commanded the golden disc to swivel towards him, the spinning blade hungry to cleave him in half. Yet Kazuya vaulted over the lethal whirlwind of steel, evading its deadly embrace. In a blink, he employed his sonido skill once more, flashing away to another mountain in the distance. His sonido was extremely polished, so much so that Sirachi was having a hard time catching him with her Zampakudo. This speed enhancement ability, however, had a steep cost in Ryuryoku. As a gifted Vasto Lord, he had all the Ryuryoku in the world to run circles around the Goth Arankar for a day or two. He wasn't looking to just run, though. He wanted to defeat her with his own hands. To prove that Haribel's training bore a fruit sweeter than honey. Sirachi, hot on his heels, swung her whip in an enormous arc. He leaped over the trajectory and dodged the follow-up attacks like a specter. Well, enough running around. Sirachi made a twisted face. I should be saying that. Stop and face your punishment, hooligan. His flashy maneuvers gave her whip a hard time. Kazuya flashed a wicked smile and his knuckles sparked with a gentle blue light. You asked for it, woman. Don't cry now. What is that? Sirachi asked, narrowing her eyes. It looks like Ryatsu, but it's more than that. Is that your special ability? All Hollows had a guaranteed chance of developing a special ability once they became Arankar. An ability based upon their soul. They could use their ability at the Vasto Lord stage, albeit to a limited degree. However, Arankars could fully unleash their ability in their resurrection state. Maybe. Cocky, eh? I'll obliterate all your resistance and tame you, before gifting you to our leader. She had cut down countless of her kind to reach her current position in Baradin's army. She could tell the battle would take too long in her current form. She chose to use her trump card. Rip off. Galandrina. Sirachi erupted with a blast of pink Ryatsu. Her resurrection form materialized, changing her into an immense white swallow-like figure. A large beak-like headpiece covered her forehead, a long feathery growing mane growing from it. She also grew two pairs of wings, one composed of five slender metallic discs on each side and the other with normal feathers. She went from a normal-looking woman to a wing predator at a moment's notice. Grinning, she flashed her enormous yet thin claw. Are you ready to be sliced apart, pitiful guy? This form just eased my guilty conscience about beating a beautiful woman. Just as Sirachi lunged at him, a figure flickered in her path, interrupting the battle before it started. An imposing figure, stood tall and well-built with an air of sinister playfulness. His black hair styled to resemble two demonic horns and the remnants of his hollow mask were a stark white plate adorning his forehead. Dun Dana Dana Dad Dad Ta. The intruder pointed at Sirachi with a dramatic pose. Hey, old friend. Fancy running into you here, in the middle of nowhere. He lied as naturally as a chameleon changing colors. He had been stalking Sirachi ever since she left their base. Neither Kazuya nor Sirachi looked all too happy about the new guest. He was, after all, another one of Espada. An Arankar even stronger than Sirachi. 
she growled at her co-worker, like a beast prepared to devour another. Fuck off, Dordoni. I told you to stay behind. She had vehemently refused to accept help from another espada to experience a stimulus to her inner heart. She believed she could crush Haribel and Kazuya single-handedly and deliver them to Las Noches on her own. Using the release form against a young fawn is unbefitting of our status. Dordoni Alessandro del Sacaccio crossed his arms with a somewhat solemn expression. There was no reason for him to obey Sirachi, who was below him in both Espada rankings and power. We came here to escort this Nino to our king, not kill him. The young fawn in question was undoubtedly the vast O'Lord rearing to throw down with Sirachi. Kazuya put out his innate ability and sighed. Sirachi is right, Nino. Stay out of her business. Let me kick her ass. Dordoni's eyes widened. You said Nino as one should. Incredible, Nino. Move or I'll have to kill you both. Kazuya's eyes glowed with the ferocity of a beast. He despised two types of people the most, those who butted in others' business for no reason and those who projected their beliefs upon others, expecting them to do what's right in their eyes. Dordoni belonged to the former category, albeit to a less annoying degree. The unfazed Arankar laughed. Go ahead then, Nino. Have your wish. I'll not save you if she kills you. Dordoni didn't wait for an answer and flickered to a hill in the distance with his sonido, taking the role of an observer over a participant. Sirachi would answer to Barrigan should any Vasto lord die here. It wouldn't be his responsibility. A win-win for him since he despised meeting Barrigan. Nobody is killing my people, a cold voice echoed as Haribel appeared in front of Kazuya, as his guardian. Her riatsu swelled to the very limits of a Vasto lord, as if provoking Sirachi to lay her hands on Kazuya. I dare. You. Sirachi's rage simmered and swelled like a tempest. Consumed by fury, she roared and launched all ten blade wings at Haribel. The spiritual particles vibrated at extreme speeds around the edges of her blade wings, enough to bisect a vast O-Lord in half with ease. Kazuya felt a cold shiver run down his spine. Move! Haribel, stealing herself for the onslaught, straightened her sword arm, ready to deflect the blades head-on. Her intention was driven not by pride, but by the fierce determination to protect Kazuya from harm. Without another thought, Kazuya seized Haribel and employed his sonido's skill to whisk them out of the path of Sirachi's ferocious assault. Are you stupid? he admonished, pushing her shoulder. You almost died. What are you even thinking? He noticed her momentary distraction, her gaze lingering not on his face, but on his arm. Trip. 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 The chilling sound drew his attention, and he flinched. Blood flowed in crimson waves, staining the pristine white sands of Hueco Mundo like paint on an artist's canvas. Haribel came out and scathed from their encounter with Sirachi's resurrection form, but he wasn't so lucky. Chapter 17 Pain the stark reality of Kazuya's injury hit him like a tidal wave, his left arm had been cleanly severed from the shoulder when he grabbed Haribel. An excruciating pain coursed through him, igniting every nerve and searing his consciousness. Though he was a soul, a hollow, his pain was as vivid and overwhelming as the most acute sensations in his life. Ack! Kazuya bit down on his tongue, suppressing the scream that threatened to escape his lips. His rigorous training with Haribel had instilled in him the importance of restraint and self-control. He had already possessed a strong sense of discipline before entering this world, but now it was being put to the ultimate test. Fuck! Haribel showed a horrified look. Kazuya, this. Kazuya. Haribel wasn't the only one terrified as three anxious voices called out from behind Kazuya. Apache, Sung Sun, and even Mila Rose raced towards him, their faces etched with worry. Apache's eyes shimmered with unshed tears, on the verge of breaking, while Sung Sun maintained her composure despite the gravity of the situation. Each of them felt the weight of Kazuya's injury and the potential consequences that lay ahead. She is too powerful. Let's make a run for it. Apache, unwilling to lose anyone, 
suggested the best strategy she could think of, running away from the threat. We can't win against her. It will be hard. Cyan Sung Sun shook her head, her expression grave. She is faster than us. Way too fast. Kazuya, remember what I told you. You can accomplish anything as long as you're alive. You can do nothing if you're dead. Sung Sun could discern that the Arankar, Surachi, initially wanted Kazuya alive, but his relentless provocation had altered the dynamic. Now, the stakes were higher, and their survival hung in the balance. Does it hurt, Nino? Dordoni asked with a grin. Does it hurt enough to make you give up? Just know that your friends will be slaughtered if you throw the towel. Dordoni could see the terror in Sung Sun's and Apache's eyes, but their determination to stand by their friend was unwavering. They were willing to face their trembling hearts to support those they cared about. The kind of friends who make sacrifices for others. Nino is fortunate. He had once been like them, until the war had claimed the lives of everyone he cared about. Now, he had no one worth sacrificing his life for. The memories of his past life, filled with camaraderie and selflessness, seemed like a distant dream as he stood there, detached from the bonds that once held him together. Forged in flames of war, Dordoni was reborn as a demon. No way, geez. Kazuya closed his eyes and drew in a deep breath as he felt the agonizing pain running through his body. Despite it all, he opened his eyes again and forced a smile. Girls, tis but a scratch. I can regain it easily. Scratch? Your arm's off. Apache was losing her mind over their safety. You make me mad. Harabel glared at the Espadas. Despite frantically rummaging through her mind, she could find no way out of the dire situation she was in. She closed her eyes before opening them again with renewed determination. There is one way they can escape safely. Her most despised act, sacrifice. Don't even think about that, Haribel. Kazuya shut down her idea as if he could read her mind. His eyes blazed with defiance and rage. This is my fight. Stay out of it. Haribel stood there, shocked out of her mind. He turned his back on her and walked to his previous spot, even as the pain was killing him from inside. Surachi hovered above him, a condescending smirk etched across her face as she reveled in his pain. She cast a fleeting glance at the severed arm twitching on the ground between them, daring him to make a move. Can't take the pain now, big boy? I'll do you a favor then. Take your arm and heal yourself. Her intentions were clear, she sought to thoroughly humiliate him and crush his resilient spirit. Her haughty demeanor and mocking tone were yet another demonstration of her arrogance, a reflection of her belief in her own superiority. Kazuya picked up his severed arm and brought it close to his shoulder. The residual Ryoku within the limb sought him instinctively. As the two sources of power connected, the detached limb was yanked into its rightful position, seamlessly reattaching itself. While his regeneration skill could fully recreate the limb from scratch, even if the arm had been lost. The process could have taken days or even weeks. As the sensation returned to his left arm and fingers, Kazuya allowed himself a moment of relief. Phew. I thought I lost an arm. Ability, pain resistance acquired. Current master level, basic. His experience crystallized into a great skill for prolonged battles. Ready to fight now? He flexed his left arm and covered his knuckles with his aspect of death. Let's continue our dance. I'll wipe that cheekiness from your mug. Surachi flapped both pairs of wings and charged at Kazuya. The blade wings approached from both sides, poised to slice him into pieces. Kazuya proved to be one step ahead again, outsmarting her with his sonido. In the blink of an eye, he teleported above her, evading the deadly bladed wings that whistled through the air where he had just stood moments before. I am only using two wings. It's unfair of you to use four. He reached out and traced the middle of her bladed wings, his hands meeting in the center. His riazza left a hazy blue glow on her wings. Get off my back, she growled, attempting to grab him with her long tail. But once again, he evaded her grasp with his quick reflexes. 
She turned and glared at him, only to feel her wings grow heavier and heavier with each breath until she couldn't control them. Her smaller feathery wings couldn't keep her afloat, either. Surachi descended, struggling to maintain her balance and grace. In a hurry, she solidified Riatsu beneath her feet to keep herself in the air. What did you do? Oh, come on now. You can't honestly be that oblivious, he chuckled. All right, I'll break it down for you in terms a toddler could comprehend. I increased the weight of your metallic wings. Since her wings weren't directly protected by her Riatsu, he could easily increase their weight with a little amount of Ryoku, taking away one of her strongest offensive weapons with ease. The simple structure of the wings made it even easier to manipulate. Surachi attempted to infuse her wings with Ryoku, hoping to eradicate his aspect of death, but to no avail. He had irreversibly altered their properties. I really like them, but I have no choice now. All right then. She gave a nonchalant shrug, and the once formidable bladed wings plummeted to the ground, their metallic clangs echoing in the air. The colossal white claws slipped from her grasp. What remained were two elongated bones, a skeletal reminder of her former wings, a pair of lighter wings, and a dangerous, whip-like tail that seemed to harbor a life of its own. Chapter 18 End of Despair Kazuya observed Surachi with a look of admiration. By altering her physical form without deactivating her resurrection, Surachi had permanently damaged her Zampakudo. She could never wield her bladed wings and claws again, and more crucially, she would never assume her previous human form again. The lengths she will go to defeat him were both shocking and admirable. Her unwavering pride as an espada refused to let her back down, regardless of the challenge. Surachi, no matter how much of a bitch you are, he said. I can't help but admire you. I don't need your pity or respect, Surachi spat lowered her gaze, her wild silver mane casting a shadow over her sweat-drenched face. I'm a soldier. A warrior. I'll defeat you and drag you to Berrigan, even if it kills me. Surachi's life had always been a whirlwind of stolen moments and borrowed time. She had once roamed the desolate landscapes of Hueco Mundo, an aimless Ajuchas who tore her mask off in a futile attempt to escape her despair. But she survived, even evolving further into an Arankar. It was the biggest mistake of her life as Berrigan learned of her power and forced her into submission as one of his espada. She was shackled to his cruel reign, a puppet dancing to his every whim. The alternative was becoming a husk of a soul within a madman's lab. I'll liberate you from Berrigan's oppression, Kazuya said, his voice tinged with both empathy and conviction. With death. As much as he sympathized with her helplessness, they stood on opposite ends of roads as enemies. He couldn't afford to show her any mercy. Sirachi's laughter rang out, harsh and defiant, as she turned to Dordoni. Dordoni, handle the other vast O Lord over there. I won't have much energy left after dealing with this guy. That one is also strong. It was rare for her to put down her pride and seek assistance, even from fellow soldiers under the same ruler. Yet today, she made an exception, believing that her battle with Kazuya could very well be her last. She was determined to fulfill her duty as an espada to the bitter end, just to avoid the same fate as the other Berrigan subordinates who failed him. Dordoni nodded at her request. I can do that, Surachi. I'll focus my Ryoku into one attack. Surachi didn't stop a second to despair. She still had hope in wrecking Kazuya, the menacing tail looming behind her could finally use the Ryoku she had previously channeled to maintain control over her wings. Her standing tail had projected an enormous pink fan at its end. A sharp fan of Riatsu that could slice through physical matters with ease. I won't hold back either then. Kazuya closed his eyes, feeling every fiber of Rasher making up his hollow body. Channeling his aspect of death, he slipped wisps of his Riatsu within his Rasher, causing it to integrate and intermingle with his body. A technique he had refined endlessly in the past month to raise the density of his muscles, leading to more explosive power and durability at the cost of lowered mobility. Could he outmatch an Ajucha's Arankar in terms of durability? Probably not. But he felt like honoring Surachi for once and taking her head on. 
it was a rare chance to engage in a bloody fight with an espada. A pissed-off, slightly depressed espada, but an espada nevertheless. Sirachi grinned at his resolve. Come. I'll show you the despair of being a weak worm in Hueco Mundo. The despair of groveling at the feet of those stronger than you. The two charged at each other. Sirachi touched the ground as her tail extended at him, the massive fan swinging down at him. He kicked the fan away and charged at Sirachi, his wings aiding his mobility greatly. Sirachi leaped back, narrowly avoiding Kazuya's fist, and retaliated by swatting him with the flat side of her fan. He barely raised his arms to block the impact. Yet he was sent careening through the air, his body momentarily stunned by the blow. Sirachi rubbed her sweaty face with the back of her hand and breathed heavily. Blast you. You think I'll fight you with honor now? After all the bullshit you pulled. She had felt death when Kazuya's fist nearly grazed her. Her arrow, once thought to be impenetrable, now seemed vulnerable against his crushing power of oppression. She saw the same fear mirrored in his eyes. He, too, would not survive many a direct hit from her lethal tail. Whoever landed a clean hit would emerge victorious. Ah, uh -huh, karma is a bitch. Kazuya chuckled as he dusted his shirt. Not a bigger bitch than you. With those final words, the two warriors charged towards one another, their speed and power intensified by the knowledge that everything rested on this final exchange. The ground rumbled beneath their feet as they collided, a dazzling explosion of Ryatsu erupting around them. They were in Kazuya's most comfortable fighting spot, close range. He had trained his fighting skills with Haribel, another melee fighter. Even with reduced speed, he could avoid her attacks by his intuition. Sirachi was a little exhausted after casting her resurrection form, a problem every natural Arankar had to deal with due to their unstable powers. Her exhaustion was further intensified by the burden that came with permanently damaging her Zampakudo. She grew slower with each exchange, the battle showing its effect on her. Sidestepping her fan, Kazuya lunged into her zone and smashed his fist in her belly. The enhanced fist instantly broke through her arrow and sent her a few steps back. She collapsed to her knees, blood spewing from her mouth. Cough. 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 You. You bastard. She wiped the crimson stains with her white dress and glared at him. While she was worse for wear, he looked energetic, as if he hadn't been battling her all this time. You are disgusting. But I love you, sweetheart. Gritting her teeth, Sirachi poured the last of her Ryurioku to seal her wound. She had sacrificed the high-level regeneration one would need to heal internal wounds, but she could still close those wounds so they won't impact her performance. She forced herself back to her feet, her fan morphing into a long spear. With its extended reach and increased difficulty to evade, the weapon demanded more precision than ever before. Just give up, Sirachi. You are in no condition to use that. The way she looked, it was hard to say she could bring out its full power. Shut up! Growling like a cornered beast, she lunged at him once more. Though her physical reserves were all but depleted, her indomitable spirit refused to yield. Armed with nothing more than a spear and a weary body, she clung to the desperate hope that somehow, she would breach his defenses and deliver a decisive strike. Kazuya parried her spear strikes with precision, each deflection seemingly effortless. Despite appearing unscathed, he struggled internally, enhancing his body with oppression raised his fatigue like no tomorrow. Dordoni is eyeing me. I have to end this fast. Dordoni remained an unpredictable variable, his intentions a mystery to Kazuya. Evading a barrage of spear thrusts, Kazuya utilized Sonido to maneuver behind Sirachi. He tightened his fist and struck. His heavy fist split open the back of her head. Sirachi couldn't react in time and crumpled to her knees before collapsing onto the white sands. Blood seeped from her wound, staining her silver mane and the pristine sands with its deep crimson hue. Farewell, my first opponent. You will not be missed. A hint of sadness washed over Kazuya as he gazed at the fallen Sirachi. In different circumstances, she might have become a cherished friend or even a passionate lover. Not in this timeline. 
It was an anticlimactic yet fitting end for the prideful Sirachi. Chapter 19 Broken Dordoni had been somewhat skeptical of Kazuya's abilities as a vasto lord until he witnessed the power that made Sirachi's bladed wings useless. His amusement turned to shock at that very moment. He couldn't tell the origin of the energy enveloping Kazuya's arms, the energy single-handedly pushed Sirachi away and changed the tide of the battle. I've never seen anything like this. Nino's ability is on the level of an aspect of death. In the struggling youth, Dordoni saw potential. A talent who could challenge the current number one Espada, a potential threat to King Berrigan's eternal reign over Hueco Mundo. As an Espada, he should intervene in the fight and slay Kazuya before he could even come close to becoming a menace to his lord. To eliminate the threat in its infancy. Yet Dordoni couldn't help but imagine a world without King Berrigan in Lost No Chase. A beautiful world where hollows weren't forced into submission by a heartless tyrant. Like all good things, this beautiful reality would require sacrifices to come to fruition. In order to bring down Berrigan, Kazuya would have to become a demon himself. Dordoni sighed. I'm asking too much from Nino. Should I kill his companions to make him loathe Berrigan? While Dordoni pondered making a real enemy out of Kazuya, Surachi's battle ended with her defeat. Surachi is still alive, Nino. What are you doing by sparing her? Dordoni shook his head, a disappointed sigh leaving his lips. Nino, you are not the demon Hueco Mundo needs. To give me hope, I must destroy you. Maybe you'll show your true potential if I push you. Haribel forgot to blink as the intense battle unfolded before her, her eyes shimmering with a blend of pride and concern for Kazuya. She marveled at how far he had come in such a short time, absorbing her teachings and growing as a warrior. Yet, the ferocity of the battle made her heart race with worry. The maternal instinct within her yearned to intervene, to crush Surachi and shield him from harm. No, it's his fight. I can't intervene. She gritted her teeth, her heart pounding in her chest as she reminded herself that this was Kazuya's battle to fight, not hers. It was essential for him to face this challenge on his own, to grow and test his limits. As anticipated, he bested Surachi, delivering a decisive blow to her head. Yet, he bore no look of satisfaction. That's war. No warrior truly wins. She was truly pleased to see Kazuya feeling no satisfaction with the battle. Feeling a sudden chill in the air, she turned to Dordoni, who glared at Kazuya with killing intent in his eyes. The moment she noticed the murderous glare, she knew she had to act and protect Kazuya. Do not think about it. Haribel launched herself towards Dordoni, her powerful legs propelling her with incredible speed. Her eyes narrowed, focused entirely on her target, the number three Espada who dared threaten her precious. Golden Riatsu enveloped her. She wouldn't allow anyone to sneak attack Kazuya, no matter how strong they were. Dordoni turned his attention towards her, his eyes widening slightly in surprise. He hadn't expected her to engage him directly, but he quickly adjusted, a sinister grin spreading across his face. Well, well. I didn't think you would be so quick. This is better for me. I'll end the two Vasto Lord than the Ajuchas over there. Easy peasy dot. Kazuya turned around to Dordoni. One versus five. Do you like those odds? Like? I love them. Dordoni clutched the katana hanging by his waist. Whirl. As he unsheathed the Zampakudo, a storm rose with him in the center and blew Haribel away. He was the eye of the storm. The Baron of Wind. Giralda. His Zampakudo transformed into a pair of large, wind-based, bladed turbines attached to his wrists and legs. Two giant, curved horns protruded from his shoulders. Two cyclones jet out from the exhaust spores on his legs, granting him the ability to fly. Another two cyclones poured from the armor on his wrists, each ending with a large bird head. His resurrection form was unshackled. Kazuya exhaled and tightened his fist. Dordoni's spiritual pressure was a cut above Surachi's level. As you wish, man. I'll send you to Surachi in the second afterlife. 
Kazuya, step back, Haribel said, regaining her footing and glancing in his direction. Take everyone and leave. I'll take care of him. Her determination to make the ultimate sacrifice only intensified upon witnessing Kazuya's growth. She also believed Kazuya wouldn't have enough strength in him to fight Dordoni after his grueling battle with Sarachi. Go! She roared at Kazuya and hurled herself back at Dordoni, only to be repelled once more. His wind attacks were lethal to her close combat style, preventing her from getting near him. She attempted to slice through the cyclones with her sword, but they regenerated rapidly. Soon, she was overpowered. The wind sliced into her armor, shattering it in places, but she persisted in her ferocious assault. Her relentless aggression was like a cornered lioness, desperate to protect her cub. Woman, are you foolish? Dordoni taunted. You can't defeat the weakest Espada with your power. Stop wasting my time. Kazuya caught Haribel midair and landed near Apache. You can't defeat him with brute strength. I'm an exception with my ability. Haribel audibly gritted her teeth and shoved him away, rising to her feet. I don't need to defeat him. I just need to buy time for you. Just go away. He couldn't help but roll his eyes. Don't be so self-centered, Haribel. Who said you could sacrifice yourself? All I'm saying is, shut up and fight him with me. End this lover's quarrel, or I'll end you both, Dordoni cackled like a madman, reveling in his role as the villain. I'm itching for a battle here, you know? You madman. Mila Rose roared at Dordoni, fully aware of the power the Aaron Carr wielded and the risk she was taking in provoking him. Why are you doing this? Leave us alone. You ask for my reason? Dordoni chuckled, his voice tripping with malevolence. We came here to do a job in peace, but your friend here is too arrogant and hot-headed. Every ounce of pain I'm about to inflict, just remember he brought it upon himself. You. In Hueco Mundo, the king, the emperor, the god is the one with the mightiest fist. If you find this system unfair by any stretch, grow your fangs and tear it apart. Until then, you are bound to Lord Berrigan beneath Hueco Mundo's sky. Mila Rose glared at Dordoni before she shifted her gaze to Kazuya. Just like Haribel, she assumed that Kazuya wasn't in any shape to fight a foe of Dordoni's level. And Haribel couldn't even close the gap between them. It's my turn to protect them and him. They hadn't been on the best of terms these past days. In fact, she had barely started to know him without her previous bias. How could she do that if he or Haribel died here today? Kill Dordoni and protect him from Berrigan, both goals aligned with each other. Fangs. I'll grow my fangs and rip you limb to limb. With a shaking roar, she smashed her head against Kazuya's steel-like knee. Crack. 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 Mila Rose's golden mask fractured, and a burst of golden light enveloped her. Chapter 20, Aaron Karazation. No one could prevent Mila Rose from shattering her hollow mask, the sudden act caught both Haribel and Kazuya off guard. As Mila Rose's Riatsu surged, it resembled the energy of the unnamed Ajuchas who had perished midway through their Arankar transformations. Yet, amid the chaos and uncertainty, Kazuya stood there, observing Mila Rose with a look of fascination etched on his face. He could sense a heartbeat, distinct from his own, resonating within him. It was as if their hearts had become one, united by his mysterious innate ability, the crumbling heart, hollow, dot. Mila Rose's rampaging Riatsu suggested she was losing control over her instincts, her desires and instincts teetering on the brink of overpowering her. Haribel's eyes remained locked on Mila Rose, unblinking. What has she done? Mila Rose? Sun Sun quietly regarded Mila Rose. She understood the significance of what was happening to her friend, for Kazuya had often enlightened them about the intricate process and advantages of becoming an Arankar weeks ago. It only made her more concerned for Mila Rose. You've got to pull through, kitten, Sun Sun whispered. Although she and Mila Rose fought and teased each other all the time, she cherished Mila Rose's friendship more than anyone in the world. Mila Rose was there as Haribel's oldest companion. 
Haribel might lose herself if anything happened to Mila Rose. Apache nudged Sun Sun with her horn. Trust me, she will. Rose is too stubborn to die like this. While she wasn't best buddies with Mila Rose, she could see how much Mila Rose meant to Haribel and Sung Sun. It was enough for her to pray for Mila Rose's success. Ha ha, I know. Laughter tinged with worry escaped them as they watched Mila Rose's struggle, their hearts pounding with anxiety. Kazuya, on the other hand, focused on the sensation of the other heart within his chest. Mila Rose, take control, break the barriers, and seal your power within a vessel. Prove to me you aren't a cowardly kitten, but a smart and ferocious lion. Show me your prided fangs. His advice ignited a defiant spark within her. Who are you calling a cowardly kitten? As the golden light dissipated, it unveiled a striking humanoid figure. A tall, dark-skinned woman wielding a massive black broadsword, her imposing presence resembling an Amazonian warrior. Remnants of her hollow form were visible in her golden mane, the bone claws that supported her ample bosom, the armored thong she wore, and the armor adorning her neck, as well as her gloves and knee-length boots. Mila Rose's resurrection form was something else. Apache and Sun Sun let out a roar of cheer and admiration. The Arankar transformation worked just as Kazuya described, perhaps more mysterious than his stories. I don't want to be left behind, Apache whispered as she gritted her teeth. I will. Sun Sun wrapped her tail around Apache's feet. Slow it down. Now isn't our time. Apache begrudgingly nodded and fired a small ball of Ryoku at Mila Rose. It didn't hurt Mila Rose, but drew her attention. Mila Rose, kick his ass. She placed her hope in Mila Rose, knowing an opponent like Dordoni could suppress her with his Ryatsu alone. They were different levels of existence, one she couldn't fight without being a vast lord or tearing her mask. Mila Rose nodded solemnly and shifted her gaze to Kazuya. Thanks for your help. His taunt and, more crucially, his Ryoku had helped when she needed it. Without him, she would have succumbed to her instincts. Without him, she would have never sealed her hollow powers in a blade. Kazuya whistled, admiring Mila Rose's alluring curves, especially her lovely bosom. People awaken their true inner powers when they want to protect something. A fierce desire to protect. He quoted Yoruchi's words, which were yet to be said in this timeline. The will to protect and power of friendship existed even in the world of Bleach, Mila Rose was a living testament to the legendary power of friendship. Protect? Mila Rose whispered and looked around her, scratching her wavy black hair. Ah, fine. I'll protect everyone because I'm the strongest among us. Kazuya let her bask in the misunderstanding for the time being. What a good kitten. I'm no kitten. I'm a lion. Mila Rose made a vicious face, showcasing her lion-like fangs. She gripped her sword in a fighting stance. I'll destroy you with my sword, Dordoni. Cyclone surged with even more intensity as Dordoni approached Mila Rose. Break time's over then. Prepare to die. The bird-headed cyclones threatened to engulf Mila Rose. She swung her broadsword with barbarian might, dissipating the wind with its sheer force. Get lost with the wind. Dordoni's armor pores recreated the cyclones. I can keep doing this forever. I am the Storm Baron. Mila Rose planted her feet on the ground and launched herself at Dordoni with a sonic boom. Being an Arankar, she could proficiently make use of the Sonido ability. Sun Sun and Apache, unable to venture near the ferocious clash, unleashed their Ciro rays from a safe distance. Dordoni cut down the Ciro with fierce wind blades with ease. Their Ciro wasn't harming Dordoni, but it greatly annoyed him and took away his focus. Kazuya found it hard to believe that the Trace Bestias faced one of the top Espada in this timeline as their first team battle. Espada's future should be a little different now. He sighed and placed a hand on Haribel's shoulder. Isn't her form beautiful? Beautiful and powerful. From a week of juches to fighting on an equal level with an Espada, Mila Rose's growth was astonishing, and all it took was determination and some help from his skill. Haribel traced her mask. 
I'm ready to fracture mine if Dordoni overpowers Rose. He shook his head. I already told you, Haribel. No more sacrifices. I still have a trump card to beat him. He was lying without blinking an eye. He could easily take down Dordoni if his Riazza tank was full. Unfortunately, the fight with Sirachi took a great toll on his spiritual power reserves. As much as he wanted to see Haribel's Erencar form, he didn't feel like taking a gamble with her life. I learned a lot. It was worth it. He cast a glance towards Sirachi, who still lay there without any movement. Despite her seemingly dead state, he could feel fluctuations of her Riazza now. Damn she survived? He had truly overestimated his attack power and underestimated Sirachi's arrow. The attack that was meant to kill her only knocked her out. Her head wound had nearly closed. And Erencar's vitality was a force to be reckoned with, only beheading or destroying their heart guaranteed their demise. Sirachi's fingers dug into the sand as she lifted her head, her eyes shaking in fear. Finish me. Haribel, watch over them for me. I'll be back in a minute. Chapter 21 Gift of Freedom Kazuya walked over to Sirachi and squatted before her. As the victor, I have the right to decide your fate. What if I don't want to play along with your death fetish? Sirachi's face turned horrified as despair took over. I'm begging you, please kill me and mutilate my corpse. I don't want to end up in his research facility. Trembling with fear and frailty, Sirachi pleaded for him to extinguish her suffering. She had abandoned all hope of escaping this place after failing her mission and damaging her Zampakudo. Barrigan would hunt her down if she left this place alive. If she was found dead with an intact corpse, Sailapora would do inhumane experiments on her. Kazuya reached out and compassionately caressed her head. I won't kill you. But I'll give you a choice. The thing is, I want to take down Barrigan for trying to rob my freedom. I know you hold no love for him, either. Will you help me in overthrowing him? Defeating Barrigan with his current strength was nothing more than a pipe dream. But he had to start somewhere if he wanted to destroy the tyrant who planned to seize his freedom in Hueco Mundo. No one who wished to shackle his freedom would go unharmed. Sirachi's eyes widened in disbelief, clearly not expecting him to offer her a choice between life and inevitable death. She weighed her options, return to Los Noches and get thrown into Salaporo's laboratory for her failure or join Kazuya in destroying the tyrant who forced her into submission. The choice would be obvious for anyone with common sense. I will. I will blast Barrigan and his lunatic cult. Help me. Kazuya stared into her eyes as if he was looking into her soul. Sirachi didn't flinch from his stern gaze, instead showing a resolute look. Welcome to the club, Miss Goth. He smiled. Now, hold tight. I'ma get you to a safe place. Hoisting his fifth ally in Hueco Mundo like a wounded princess, he soared through the sky, his wings carrying them towards his cave. Goodness, you're quite heavy in this form. Her wings and tail contributed a surprising amount of weight to her curvy form. I have armor concealed beneath my undergarments. It makes no sense for a woman to wear armor there. Sirachi's delicate fingers clasped his neck, her violet lips curving into a sly smile. You don't understand the brutality of hollows. They will resort to any measure to win. Injuring your opponent's genitalia is a very effective tactic. You are too quick or I'd have definitely smashed your junk. Kazuya couldn't help but shudder. He had almost lost his penis in his previous life. The fact that Hollow saw no shame in resorting to such a brutal measure worried him. You all are a bunch of animals. All Hollows are. He talked like friends as if they weren't fighting to murder each other a couple of minutes ago. As they entered the cave, he carefully propped her against the jagged walls. Focus on recovering. I'll deal with Dordoni. Don't linger here, her voice, barely more than a whisper, carried a note of urgency. Barrigan will discover. Her words trailed off as she succumbed to unconsciousness once more. Kazuya left Sirachi to recuperate and join Haribel, who stared intently at the fierce battle unfolding before them. 
Dordoni dispersed his bird-headed tornadoes and hurled a behemoth version of it. The tornado rushed at Mila Rose, its maw open wide as if it yearned to consume her whole. Not today, bastard, Mila Rose retorted, her voice resonating with steely determination. Grasping her broadsword with a white-knuckled grip, she carved a colossal arc through the air, her golden mane thrashing wildly. The sheer power of her assault cleaved the cyclone, dispersing it. Mila Rose descended to the ground, her labored breaths displaying her exhaustion. Cuts marred her toned form, yet Dordoni appeared considerably more battered. The hollow plate adorning his forehead lay half-shattered, blood streaking his visage like crimson tears. One of his shoulder spikes had snapped clean off at its base. Were it not for the augmentation of his hierro by his resurrection ability, he would have met his demise. His defense was absurd. With her sword lowered, Mila Rose extended her palm, summoning a pulsating orb of orange energy. Without hesitation, she propelled Ciro forth with a powerful punch. Take my Ciro, bitch. The cataclysmic orange beam surged towards Dordoni, who countered with a series of deft hand gestures, ultimately forming a pentagon with his fingers. A sanguine Ciro erupted from within the pentagon, colliding with Mila Rose's Ciro. The violent impact catapulted Dordoni through the air, but he recovered with the help of his tornado. As he deflected yet another Ciro from Mila Rose, his Riatsu had significantly diminished from the time he first released. Kazuya hadn't expected Mila Rose to bring Dordoni down to this level. Then again, this Dordoni had yet to gain any power from Aizen Sogyoku. Haribel, what else did I miss? Haribel recounted the action to Kazuya. Dordoni's hierro was indeed impressive, but he couldn't disregard the full-powered Ciro unleashed by strong ajuchas such as Apache and Sung Sun, forced to rely on his tornadoes to counter, Mila Rose seized the chance to deliver her own Ciro blast. A mere month prior, the trio would have posed no threat to Dordoni. However, Kazuya's innate ability, crumbling heart, elevated their prowess to the peak of ajuchas. As an Ajucha's Arancar, Dordoni found it nigh impossible to inflict damage upon a strength-centric Arancar like Mila Rose. Great teamwork, he murmured. Where are they? Haribel cast a worried glance in the opposite direction. He spotted the deer and snakes sprawled on the sidelines, apparently unharmed. Out of energy, I assume. Haribel nodded. They did their part. By the way, are you upset about my decision concerning Sirachi? Haribel's eyes shimmered with emotions before she gestured with her sword arm at Dordoni. We'll discuss the Espada after we deal with him. I also have things to talk about, he whispered, coming up with ways to explain his journey to the Soul Society. Fuck! Instead of overthinking everything, he swung his wings and approached Dordoni. A small smirk made its way to Dordoni's face. Nino, you have finally arrived. Kazuya disregarded Dordoni and glanced over his shoulder at Mila Rose. Thanks for wearing him down, kitten. I'll take over from here. Stop calling me kitten. Skull face. Skull face? Is that supposed to be an insult? Mila Rose shrugged and flew toward Haribel. After some talking, Mila Rose threw some sun and Apache on her shoulders and carried them to their base. Haribel, alone, intently watched Kazuya prepare to fight another Arancar. Her hands itched to stop the fight, but she couldn't go against Kazuya's wishes. Chapter 22 Responsibility Kazuya flexed his arms. The strengthening of his muscles by oppression was still present and would remain until he used oppression again to lower the density of his muscles. He looked at Dordoni. How will Berrigan respond when he gets today's report? Depending on his mood. In the best case scenario, he sends more espada. The worst case scenario, he sends more espada. Huh? What's the difference in the best and worst scenarios then? The orders he gives to espadas? Dordoni grinned. You wouldn't want to know the worst orders. I won't ask then. Let's start. I was about to say the same, Nino. Kazuya charged recklessly. Dordoni roared like a ferocious beast, and his riatsu swelled to nearly its peak. 
more tornadoes emerged from his armor pieces, bird heads attached to their ends. Dordoni launched kicks and punches from a distance. The bird-headed wind creatures mimicked his movements and struck Kazuya. The assault flung Kazuya towards the ground. Using his wings, he steadied himself and assessed his chest. Apart from superficial cuts, he had sustained no significant injuries. This method is brilliant for improving my defense. Dordoni widened his eyes. Even an Aaron Carzi arrow is cut upon contact with my razor-sharp wind. What kind of technique are you using to protect your body, Nino? Why are your clothes unharmed? My clothes are special. His shirt and jeans have remained the same since he arrived in this world, apart from being stained with his blood. He had used Riatsu to clean the shirt time and time again, but its durability couldn't be denied. I see, Nino. Following their strange exchange, the two resumed exchanging blows. Unable to penetrate the multitude of cyclones, Kazuya opted to launch zero rays from a distance. Battered and bruised, Dordoni persistently countered Kazuya's every attack, his wind cyclones playing a big part in keeping Kazuya away from melee range and stopping the zero rays. However, he couldn't keep it up indefinitely. Eventually, his ability depleted his Ryurioku, and his Resurrection deactivated. Although Dordoni had gained a substantial amount of Ryurioku after becoming an Erenkar, he couldn't match Kazuya's absurd efficiency and monstrous rate of Ryurioku recovery. His endurance was unmatched among the vast Lord class, the main reason for his rapid improvement in the last month. Kazuya smirked. We're on an even field now. Dordoni held his katana with a purple hilt and drew a cross in the air. Not even close, Nino. Your spatial awareness is subpar. You can hardly distinguish between a feint and a genuine attack. And you're pathetic at concealing your intent. In short, Ninu, you are solely lacking in experience compared to a veteran espada such as I. Kazuya's lips lifted in amusement. Apologies for being so young. I wouldn't choose to be a one-month-old Vasto Lord if I had the option. One month? Nino is only one month old? That's impossible. It takes decades to go from a Jillian to an Ajuchas, unless you're one of those. Natural-born Vasto Lord? Indeed, I am one of those anomalies. No fucking wonder you could beat the crap out of Surachi. She never stood a chance against someone of your potential. With a chuckle, Kazuya unleashed a sonic boom, instantly appearing in front of Dordoni. The playful Erenkar didn't hesitate to slash at Kazuya's neck with his chipped katana. Kazuya reached out, seizing the blade with his bare hands. The metal bit into his palm but couldn't sever it entirely. Blood oozed down like a crimson waterfall. His regeneration tried to heal his wound, but the katana stuck in his palm made it impossible to do so. He had the blessing of the pain resistance skill, otherwise, the pain would force him into a pitiful state. Nino, Kazuya called Dordoni with a wicked grin as a blue Riatsu surged from his wounded hand. Say goodbye to your Zampakudo. Before Dordoni snatched away his Zampakudo, Kazuya activated his aspect of death. An Erenkar's Zampakudo embodied their hollow powers from before they became an Erenkar. It also sealed away their hollow attribute, allowing them to attain human-like emotions. One could argue that an Erenkar's Zampakudo held equal or perhaps more importance for a hollow than it did for a Shinigami. Despite Zampakudo's extraordinary capabilities, the katana clutched in Kazuya's hand was a physical object. With the power of oppression, he could manipulate any physical matter, as long as he understood its nature or brute force it with immense Ryuryoku. As Kazuya tightened his grip on the katana, the entire blade cracked before snapping in two. Dordoni stood frozen, clutching the hilt. After a tense moment of silence, he lowered his head. I should have been more cautious after I saw you fooling Sirachi. Dordoni fell victim to his own veteran experience. A true warrior would cut down their enemy without hesitation. That very impulse led to the demise of his Zampakudo. I have been outsmarted. Your ability, your Riatsu can alter physical properties of anything it touches. Yeah. I made your Zampakudo extremely brittle. Despite his defeat, Dordoni threw his head back and laughed heartily. 
Well played, Nino. You might give the old king some trouble. I certainly hope you do. Well, you have to conquer me before you go anywhere. As long as I breathe and my body can move, I'll continue to fight. That's what a soldier does, Nino. Refusing to grant Kazuya a simple win, Dordoni lunged forward, showing his sharp combat abilities with an intense barrage of punches and kicks. Unyielding, Kazuya expertly parried each of Dordoni's strikes, ensuring that none found their mark on his body. After what seemed like minutes, Kazuya found an opening and struck Dordoni's face, propelling him toward the ground. He caught up to Dordoni using Sonido and unleashed a powerful kick that sent him crashing into a nearby mountain. Blood splattered from Dordoni's mouth as he gasped for breath. Chapter 23 Sacrifice In a blur of motion, Kazuya materialized beside the battered Dordoni, his fingers clutching the defeated warrior's hair with a firm grip. A smile tugged at the corner of his lips. That was one hell of a battle, he said, his voice carrying a hint of admiration. Please don't try to take anyone's freedom in the next life. It's the worst thing you can do to a person, well, besides some messed up stuff like making them watch Boku no Pico or a thousand episodes of One Piece. With a weak, raspy chuckle, blood flecked Dordoni's lips as he coughed. You've bested me, Nino. But beware. Barrigan approaches. Devour me, Nino. Inherit my Ryurioku, and become stronger. Kazuya's gaze bore into Dordoni, his thoughts racing. Although he had lived in Hueco Mundo for a month, he had never consumed Hollow's flesh aka soul. The sheer magnitude of Dordoni's Riatsu tempted him. You goaded me into ending your life, he whispered. What was your endgame, Dordoni? Why were you so desperate to die? Dordoni's killing intent was far from genuine like Sirachi. She truly wanted him dead while he pretended to have malicious intent for him. He could have taken Mila Rose and Apache hostages if he was so eager to kill him. He was as honorable and chivalrous as a princess's ideal knight in shining armor. Sacrifice nurtures, Dordoni squeezed out and reached for something in the distance. Don't let it be in vain. Kill Barrigan or he will kill you, become a demon, Nino. Kazuya paused and intently gazed at Dordoni. He recalled Dordoni's role in the story, Dordoni taught Ichigo about the brutality of Hollows through twisted choices then he sacrificed himself to buy time for Ichigo. His aspect of death has to be sacrificed like Haribel. The revelation dawned on Kazuya, but it was too late. Dordoni's Zampakudo was completely broken unlike Surachi, his body shattered beyond repair. Even if he survived, he would never regain his former strength, let alone surpass it. Kazuya clenched his fists. That's stupid. I will kill Barrigan for my own desires. You don't have to tell me that, let me put you out of your suffering. Using oppression, he accelerated Dordoni's heartbeat. Thump. 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 Dordoni's heart crumbled under the pressure and ceased functioning altogether. Yet, Dordoni's eyes remained open, fear and terror edged into them, even as a brave smile graced his lips. Motherfucker will give me nightmares. Kazuya gently lowered Dordoni's eyelids. It's over. For now, whispered Haribel as she silently landed beside him, taking his hand and squeezing it with comforting warmth. Are you tired? A little. Haribel led Kazuya away from Dordoni's lifeless form and had him sit by the entrance of a nearby cave. Barrigan will keep hunting us down. I'll be with you, no matter what, we'll fight him together. Kazuya would be over the moon if she didn't utter those words with the tender, motherly look in her eyes. Haribel. She looked at him, her eyes reflecting happiness. She seemed glad that he emerged from the encounter relatively unscathed. He couldn't bring himself to shatter her happiness with his questions. With a sigh, he raised his head to the ever-so-close moon of Hueco Mundo. Thank you for having my back. Haribel could tell that he had something on his mind. She chose not to pursue the matter and followed his gaze, admiring the lonely moon in the sky. You are my family, Kazuya. You, Apache, Mila Rose, Sun Sun, you all give me hope in this world. 
that we, hollows, can coexist peacefully without sacrificing each other for selfish gains. She dreamed of making Hueco Mundo a utopia of peace. But her power was severely lacking to achieve even a fraction of her dream. Without everyone, I would have given up hope. I will protect my family, with my life if I must. You are unsalvageable, Haribel. He sighed and used oppression to revert his body back to its original state. Freed from extra dense muscles, he rested his head on her lap. I'll get some sleep. He was too tired to be having an argument. She chuckled and gently stroked his hair. Sleep well. In the silence, she considered his words. He wasn't entirely wrong in calling her unsalvageable. Everything in this world came at a price. Her life was too small of a cost for the safety of her family. After all, protecting someone wasn't just helping them survive. It means giving them a place to belong. Giving them a place where they could feel safe and free. As Kazuya entered his sanctuary, he discovered an astonishing scene. Mila Rose paced around with her breasts bouncing with each step. The dark-skinned beauty stopped abruptly in front of him, placing a hand on her curvaceous hip. Kazuya's eyes traced the captivating details of her body, her rosy-hued nipples, the hollow hole just above her navel, her sculpted abdominal muscles beneath, and the enticing slit between her legs. Her resurrection form gave her a lewd armor, a luxury her normal Arancar form lacked. Apart from the three-section crown on her head and her white necklace, she was practically nude. Kazuya shook his head. Lord, have mercy. Stop staring so rudely, Skull. Mila Rose covered her crotch with one hand and covered her breasts with the other, a disapproving frown creasing her brow. Since you've observed so thoroughly, share your thoughts. This is my normal, unreleased form. Do you find it better than my Ajucha's form? She sought his approval, even though she felt confident in her Arancar form. It enabled her to achieve so much more with significantly less exertion. Her combat prowess had skyrocketed beyond her wildest expectations. It's way better, if you ask me. He took off his shirt and tossed it at her. Don't run around naked. My heart can't handle it. Prior to his hollow transformation, he had an impressive muscular build. His physique had further developed after a month of rigorous training, allowing him to stride confidently in only his jeans. Pervert. Mila Rose grinned and sniffed his shirt, her nose wrinkling. It reeks of blood. Thanks, though. I appreciate it. She donned the shirt, concealing her ample chest. The shirt extended just enough to cover her most intimate area. Despite her statuesque height of 177 centimeters, she appeared small in comparison to him. After all, he towered at an impressive 6 feet 4 inches, 192 centimeters. The difference in their height allowed her to wear his shirt as an impromptu dress, the material draping gracefully over her curves. With a flick of her wrist, she summoned a burst of riatsu, purging the bloodstains from the fabric with immaculate control of her ryoku. Her resurrection didn't give her any special ability. However, becoming an Arancar improved her base strength and Ryurioku control. Chapter 24 Transform Apache walked out of her chamber within the cave, a playful glint in her eyes as she prodded Mila Rose's butt with her horn. Stop being so narcissistic, bitch. Ouch. Stop poking my ass, you little slut. Apache walked towards Kazuya and affectionately rubbed her head against his leg. You're safe. Of course. He patted her head tenderly. Someone is unafraid of showing love today. Bastard came to take you and Haribel Sama away from us. He got what he deserved. Apache had no remorse for anyone who came to harm her or anyone close to her. She could be more ruthless than him in some aspects. Well done. Kazuya and Mila rose, Sun Sun chimed in as she slinked out of her hiding place. I propose we move before Berrigan dispatches someone to investigate the missing Espada. Before that, Kazuya turned to Mila Rose. Share your experience, Rose. It'll be helpful since everyone here wants to become an Arancar. Am I right? Hell yeah! 
I promised you I'll be the strongest Arankar. It doesn't hurt to gain more power in Hueco Mundo, especially after we made enemies with the God King. Apache and Sun Sun exchanged determined glances, their ambitions to attain the Arankar form fueled by their unique yet intertwined desires. Harabel nodded thoughtfully at their hunger for power. It's an excellent method to improve our strength, but we shouldn't be reckless. She was relieved there was a way to become strong without devouring another soul, even if it meant performing a dance with death. Mila Rose smiled, a hint of reminiscence in her eyes. I thought you wouldn't ask about that, Kazuya. Well, it was painful from what I remember. I was losing my mind until you pulled me out of it. She pointed at him with a questioning look. How did you do that? I'm not sure, he admitted, giving a helpless shrug. Perhaps our heart-to-heart -heart before the battle helped me reach your soul. He made a vague excuse for his crumbling heart ability. Being hollows and all, they wouldn't understand the concept of a system even if he told them. Oh, that. Mila Rose chuckled sheepishly. It was a weird exchange now that I look back on it. I feel bad for misunderstanding you all this time. I'm sorry for that. Apache stared at Mila Rose, eyes wide in disbelief. Did she just apologize? Is this a side effect of going through the process? Rose grew out of her immature phase, Sun Sun whispered, her eyes shining with emotions. You make me proud, girl. Mila Rose shot a glance at the pair, her eyebrows knitting together and her fists trembling. She barely held back from smashing her fist on their heads. Good Lord. I was in the wrong. Is it that bad to apologize? No, Sun Sun turned her attention to Kazuya. It appears you played a crucial role in unlocking Mila Rose's Arankar form. Is it possible that you possess an ability you're unaware of? Perhaps another advantage of being a natural Vasto Lord. Haribel Sama, what do you think? Haribel's brow creased with a thought. We can't be certain. Just stay by Kazuya if any of you choose to undergo the transformation. She hadn't been able to stop Mila Rose, even though she was present at the scene. There was no way she could intervene if the others chose to shatter their masks. Besides, Mila Rose's success would drive them to undergo the process sooner rather than later. She couldn't stop them from walking the dangerous path since she herself wished to walk upon it and rise to the ranks of Arankar. I'll be next, Apache declared, her eyes filled with determination. Should I do it now? Kazuya cupped Apache's dear head, gently rubbing her ears with his thumb. Wait for some time. Okay, Apache agreed, her voice a mixture of anticipation and understanding. Don't delay it for too long. I need to become strong. It hurts to watch everyone fight without feeling like useless trash. Sun Sun rested her head on his shoulder. I agree with her sentiment. I do not want to stand by when Berrigan sends more of them after us. Kazuya smiled, sensing their determination ignited by Mila Rose's transformation. Don't worry. I won't keep you waiting for long. He turned to Haribel and cleared his throat. I have something important to say. I do have an ability that none of you know, apart from the ability Sun Sun mentioned. It was the perfect moment to reveal one of his crucial secrets. His hollow companions had earned his trust. Kazuya summoned the system menu and opened the race editor. Before their eyes, he selected his desired race. A hole materialized in the center of his chest, an eerie abyss reminiscent of a hollow's hole. From the depths of this void, azure liquid cascaded before the said liquid caught fire. Molten blue flames roared to life, a blue fiery tempest encasing him. A round, glassy cocoon spun itself around him. Moments passed as the flames underwent a mesmerizing transformation, shifting into a lighter shade of violet. All four women held their breaths, the anticipation tightening their chests, as they wondered what kind of metamorphosis Kazuya was undergoing and what the outcome would be. The cocoon cracked, sending shards of glassy fragments into the air. The flames retreated into his chest as if they were a living entity, a sentient force returning to its origin. Chapter 25 argument. Kazuya emerged, seemingly unchanged, except for the absence of his hollow mask and his black wings. 
he had shed all traces of his hollow-esque features. The most significant change eluded their vision, but the spiritually adept hollows sensed it with ease. How? Haribel asked, her eyes trembling in shock. You didn't do it like Mila Rose, you don't feel like a hollow anymore. You feel like a... A human! Mila Rose exclaimed, her voice dripping with incredulity. What the fuck? Why are you so handsome? Sun Sun stared at him with her sharp, beady eyes, a predatory gleam dancing within them. What the fuck indeed? To be frank, anyone could imagine a charming face concealed behind Kazuya's mask. Though, he is a little older than I expected. Come on. Spill the beans. Why the hell can you do this? As per her usual antics, Apache poked his leg, but this time, her horn pierced through his thigh like a hot knife through butter. Blood gushed out in a crimson torrent, staining her once pristine white horn in its color. Kazuya gripped her horn and pushed her back with a grunt. Jeez, don't go poking around me in this form. I am weak as fuck. Miraculously, the wound closed before their eyes, as if time itself had reversed the injury and the pain dissipated. Sweet. I carried over regeneration in this form, he thought, feeling happy for the unexpected boon. Kazuya felt the urge to examine his current status, but the hollow lady's growing impatience demanded his attention. Haribel's eyes practically pleaded for him to unravel the enigma, while Mila Rose, Apache, and Sun Sun appeared shaken by the power of his transformation. Haribel approached him and observed his body from behind, her gaze lingering on the places where scars had once marred his skin, now faded after he switched his race. A hollow turning human, impossible. It was well known that dead souls turned into hollows. A hollow assuming a human-like form after Arankar transformation was nothing compared to a hollow reverting to being human, it defied the norms on so many different levels. The proof is before your eyes. Since when? From some time ago, actually. And I didn't want to use it. Right now, we don't have a choice. He scanned their surprised faces and folded his arms over his chest. We're relocating to the human world. Haribel considered his words, her eyes thoughtful as she looked to the others for their opinions. Hueco Mundo isn't safe anymore but the living world is fraught with dangers as well. Shinigami are guarding the world from hollows like us. Haribel made a valid point. Shinigami possessed equipment capable of sensing hollows in an area. I don't think it's a good idea either, Apache said, her voice heavy with concern. She had been in Hueco Mundo all her life. The thought of leaving this realm for enemy territory didn't sit well with her. Like Haribel said, the human world is being guarded by Shinigami. They will purge us to the afterlife with their Zampakudo. Between Hollows and Shinigami, Apache would rather fight her own kind, the kind she was more familiar with. Shinigami and their Zampakudo's strange abilities terrified her to the bone. Mila Rose clenched her broadsword. I don't want to run away like a cowardly bitch. I'll stand and fight. The Arankar form gave her immense confidence in her strength. Her confidence was reasonable, considering she almost brought down one of the top Espada right after her transformation. Kazuya intently listened to their reasons and turned his gaze to Sung Sun. Do you have any words of advice for me? Era, allow me to stay neutral this time. I'll go with the side who wins this argument. He took a deep breath. Sure there are Shinigami in Living World but it's a safe haven compared to Hueco Mundo. Just think about it. We barely survive facing two Espada. What would we do if the rest showed up together with Berrigan? We have zero chance to come out alive. Actual zero. He would have stayed in Hueco Mundo if his only concern was himself. No matter how many of Berrigan's soldiers appeared, he would have been able to make his escape. However, he wasn't in a position to act selfishly. While Mila Rose and Haribel would valiantly fight Arankar soldiers, Apache and Sung Sun lacked the strength to be of any real use. If they stayed safe, he could focus on gaining strength in Soul Society and Hueco Mundo respectively. He also had to expand his knowledge to harness more power from his oppression. His counterargument brought forth a wave of silence. That said, I'm open to other options. 
he gave Mila Rose a long glance. Besides engaging in a head-on fight with Berrigan, Mila Rose dodged his gaze. Don't target me. I'm just suggesting the easy methods here. We shouldn't expect much from our musclehead brain. Sung Sun took a vicious jab at Mila Rose's intelligence. Please don't thank me for the compliments. I'm just fulfilling my daily quota of roasting my favorite girl Rose. He chuckled at Sung Sun's lighthearted teasing. Rose, they have all kinds of clothes in the living world. I'll buy you a ton. Mila Rose's eyes gleamed with desire as her heart fluttered for new, shiny clothes. She brandished her zampacudo and plunged it into the ground with a resounding thud, her hands resting defiantly on its hilt. I agree with Kazuya and Haribel Sama. Let's leave for the living world. That was fast. Apache retorted. This cheapskate switched sides for some clothes. You're only agreeing with him for the sake of clothes. Sung Sun playfully lifted Mila Rose's shirt with her sinuous tail, exposing her most intimate area to the world. This kitten is so easy to read. Mila Rose yanked down her garment and scratched her thick, wavy hair. What the hell, snake? I'm saying this so all of us can survive and become strong away from Berrigan's gaze. Kazuya's proposal has logic. I have to side with him. She hid her desire to explore the living world and indulge in experiences she couldn't have as a normal hollow. They were just side benefits of moving to the living world. Sun Sun chuckled, a knowing glint in her eye. Yeah, yeah. Apache, only you are against me now. Kazuya squatted down and intimately rubbed her ears. Come on, my tomboy sweetheart. You'll lose affection points for being stubborn. Who even wants your affection points? I never said they were mine. They could be Haribel's too. Apache lowered her head and hit his knee with her hoof. Promise to buy me clothes when I become an errand car. Just that? Sure. I'll even get you sexy bikinis so we can have our private pool party. His offer came off so nice and genuine that Apache nodded without inquiring a thing about bikinis. Given that I hold the majority of votes, he began, his voice laced with a rare solemnity, I shall take the lead and scout, he paused, his gaze shifting to the deeper part of the cave. Our new guest woke up. Chapter 26 Jealousy Tap! 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 Footsteps echoed through the cave as their newest ally, Surachi, emerged from the shadowed depths, her long tail trailing on the ground like a serpent. She couldn't find rest with the chatter swirling around the cave, so she came out to greet her new teammates. Surachi's eyes widened upon seeing Kazuya's human form. It can't be, Kazuya? How did you become a human? It's one of my abilities. Kazuya's vague response hung in the air as he transformed back into his hollow form. With a deft flick of his wrist, he tore through the fabric of space using his discorer ability. The black fissure expanded, its gaping maw akin to a ravenous beast, unveiling an infinite, abyssal void. A slash in, Garganta changed to discorer. Kazuya's face contorted with unease as he gazed into the boundless expanse connecting all realms in this world. What am I looking at? Mila Rose nudged his rib, her voice tinged with apprehension. Are you sure you want to go there? I haven't been there. Me neither. Apache and Sun Sun confessed their ignorance of Garganta and its hidden dangers. They never had any desire to explore the living world and incur the wrath of Suryaiya Shinigami. Kazuya turned to Haribel, the oldest and wisest among them. Do you have any experience with this? Haribel shook her head, her golden hair softly bouncing to her movement. I can pave the path for you. You won't be harmed that way. He immediately rejected her offer, sensing her willingness to sacrifice herself for his cause. She was a truly admirable mother figure. One he couldn't handle in the current situation. Left with no choice, Kazuya walked over to the lovely goth girl and gently gripped her shoulders. Surachi didn't appear as beautiful in her current battered condition. Surachi, help out your friend, will you? Surachi felt a shiver running up her spine. His sweet, pleasing voice may as well be the whispers of a demon. Fuck, 
Surachi cursed under her breath, regretting being curious about their talk in her absence. Where do you want to go? As an espada, she had been to the living world numerous times. Instead of lying, she decided to help him out. She had to show her worth as an ally, otherwise, he would deem her useless and cast her aside. She couldn't let it happen under any circumstances. Her survival hinged upon him, after all. Unaware of her inner turmoil, he answered, The living world. To flaunt your new form? Surachi's brow arched, her face etched with skepticism. Give me some time. I don't have the required Ryuryoku to reach there. Kazuya closed the garganta and patted her shoulder reassuringly. Rest as much as you want. Call me when you're ready. Surachi departed to her resting place without wasting another second. Mila Rose suddenly snaked her arm around his shoulder and yanked him into a playful headlock. Haribel Sama, I'm borrowing him for a moment. Without waiting for any response, Mila Rose dragged Kazuya away from the group, her laughter echoing through the cave. Once Mila Rose left, the others exchanged curious glances, a mixture of bemusement and intrigue playing across their faces. Apache poked Sung Sun with her horn, her eyes narrowing in thought. Where did she take him? What do you think will happen? What do you think? Sung Sun replied, her tone full of teasing. I'll let you guess. She'll probably ask him to fight, Apache guessed, recalling Mila Rose's eagerness for swinging her sword. What do you say? Not out of the question, considering the musclehead Rose. However, Sun Sun trailed off, her voice laced with suspense, drawing Haribel's curiosity. Have you not noticed Mila Rose giving him those lingering glances? This private meeting might lead to a deeper, intimate bond between them. Sun Sun partially believed in her words. But she still said her piece to rile up Apache and Haribel, who seemed to be brewing different kinds of relationships with Kazuya. Ridiculous. He wouldn't, Apache paused, her mind flashing back to Kazuya's undisguised admiration for Mila Rose's new form. She gritted her teeth, frustration evident in her eyes. Fuck, good for them, I guess. Sung Sun could tell the underlying meaning of Apache's goodwill. You can't blame him for being drawn to Mila Rose. She is beautiful and loyal beyond words. Sung Sun poured oil on the burning flames of jealousy, anticipating the outcome to be chaotic and entertaining. Apache nodded quietly and stumbled back to her section of the cave. Era, when did Haribel Sama leave? Both of them were so engrossed in their conversation that they didn't notice Haribel quietly slipping out of the cave to follow Kazuya and Mila Rose. Sun Sun looked at the cave's entrance. This is getting interesting. Apache yearned for sleep after relentlessly unleashing Siro rays upon Dordoni, but the tempest in her heart raged on, plaguing her with restless tossing and turning. Goddamn Kazuya. She grumbled, her voice heavy with frustration. I met you first. I rescued you. Why would you go to her? She felt like a child whose prized toy had been snatched away, but she couldn't lash out at anyone. It wasn't her fault Kazuya stopped giving her much attention. In her mind, Mila Rose and Haribel were to blame. They possessed something she lacked, a quality that ensnared Kazuya and held him captive. A humanoid body closer to Kazuya's own. Apache slammed her head into the soft sand in a fit of exasperation. I can't, fuck, why am I blaming my friends? She caught herself before the darkness of her emotions could drag her down further. Rising from her resting position, she ventured out of the cave, hoping the fresh air would clear her mind. The walk did indeed rejuvenate her, sweeping away the clouds of negativity. As she wandered, a shadow flitted across her path. Raising her head, she saw a horde of Jillians moving in eerie unison, their ghostly glide sending shivers down her spine. Curiously, they didn't regard her as prey, as though something else took precedence over a powerful ajuchus. Intrigued, she sprinted after them, soon discovering the source of their hunger, a fresh Erenkar corpse brimming with Riatsu. These thieves are stealing Kazuya's game. How dare they? Gritting her teeth, she stepped forward, her Riatsu surging to its limits, which wasn't much after using everything on Siro. 
she couldn't overpower the combined Riatsu of a dozen odd Minos Grande. Get away, now! The Jillians encircled themselves in their own Riatsu, repelling Apache's razor-sharp energy. One by one, they twisted their necks in her direction, their long noses pointing at her like swords. Key. 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 Vicious screeches left their mouths as they drifted to Apache, their giant forms towering over her relatively small deer form. Undaunted, Apache charged a small Ciro at the tip of her horn. Don't force me to kill you losers. In response, the Jillians opened their maws wide, conjuring a Ciro far larger than Apache's. Even so, she refused to back down. She couldn't let these lowly Jillians steal Kazuya's hard-earned prize. This particular corpse, an Arankar, offered the only chance to strengthen Kazuya among all the hollows they had found. She would fight tooth and nail to keep it here. Fine, I'll kill you all. Fueled by passion and recklessness, Apache hurled herself against a dozen Jillians, even though her Ryurioku barely reached a quarter of its maximum capacity. Chapter 27 Innocent Love Mila Rose halted a few paces from the cave entrance and locked eyes with Kazuya. Caught off guard by her fierce gaze, Kazuya gasped dramatically. Such aggressiveness. Have you gone into heat after your transformation? Am I going to be pushed down and violated in the Amazonian position? I I refuse to be defiled in such a manner. Rolling her eyes, Mila Rose scoffed, Amazonian position what? I swear, I'll violate your ass if you don't stop spitting nonsense. He instinctively placed a protective hand over his rear, shivering. That place is off limits. If you insist on violating my rear, I will fight you to death. It's not a question about my fetish or my affection for you. It's about my honor as a man. Mila Rose laughed at his melodrama and gripped his shoulders. Shove your manliness down the drain. I didn't bring you here to mate or whatever filthy stuff you're cooking in your mind. Besides, what's the point in two hollows mating? We can't make babies as far as I know. She saw no logical reason for hollows to engage in reproductive activities. Ahem, sex is an act of pleasure. I think? He slipped into his naive, innocent personality and assumed a thoughtful look oozing with curiosity. I believe sex feels good. Mila Rose's brow furrowed in confusion. Did you remember some significant memory? If he was as handsome as he looked in his human form, Mila Rose could imagine Kazuya having a beautiful partner when he was a human. He must be recalling some memories of his past life. Humph, I am miles better than anyone he ever had in his life. A dark, envious urge overtook her, compelling her to put down anyone who had been close to Kazuya. Lost in thought, he murmured, why does that matter? I'm a ruthless, bloodthirsty hollow now, just like you. That is true. She playfully punched his chest. Hey, how did you come to learn about mating? How do you know about mating? I was born with the memories, Mila Rose mused, her fingers scratching her chin as she delved into the depths of her mind. Or I overheard it in my hollow tribe. Yes, that must be it. Someone mentioned the legend of a hollow tribe living in the darkest shadows of the abyss. They all belong to the same species and engage in mating rituals, spawning more hollows of their kind, that's how the legend goes. Kazuya's eyes flashed with recognition. Alquiora might be born in such a tribe, surrounded by hollows of a singular species. That's how he believed Alquiora's story went. You claimed hollows can't bear offspring. But now you speak of a hollow tribe capable of reproducing. What are you trying to say, Rose? Mila Rose widened her eyes. I never thought about it before. Grinning slyly, Kazuya spread his arms wide, beckoning her. Well then, shall we attempt to create some offspring of our own? Absolutely not. Mila Rose shuddered at the thought of having babies. Even if I am capable of it, I am not having a baby. Not ever. He mockingly sneered at her decision. Why not? Mila Rose spread her arms. Look around us. We're barely scraping by here. Our child will only suffer if we bring him into this hellhole of a place. 
You want a better place for our child? He raised a brow. Let's wait until I kill Berrigan. That should make Hueco Mundo more peaceful. He wasn't in any hurry to get into a relationship. After all, he would miss out on the rest of the group if he got too deep in a relationship with Mila Rose and others decided to give up. He had to seduce each and every one of them and open their eyes to the wonderful world of romance and sex. A tough but equally rewarding task. Mila Rose hesitatingly nodded before she widened her eyes. Wait, why am I discussing having babies with you? Fuck, run after me. We have something important to talk about. Without waiting for a response, she leaped gracefully over the hill and sprinted toward the next one. He chuckled and trailed after her, using his sonido to keep up with her shenanigans. Together, they sped across the stark white expanse, covering kilometers in mere minutes before halting near a cliff's edge. She laughed, pure bliss on her face. Tell me. That was fun, wasn't it? Kazuya stared at her, unamused. What do you want to do here? This spot is quite lovely for sitting and relaxing. She settled down on the edge of the cliff, her legs dangling over the side. She patted the space beside her. Join me, Skull. Mila Rose had gone to great lengths to keep this conversation hidden from the others, especially Sung Sun, who would never let her live it down. As skilled as Mila Rose was in combat, she couldn't outweat Sung Sun, Kazuya, or even Apache in a verbal spar. Her only chance of victory lay in a contest of words against the soft-spoken Haribel, which had never happened to this day. Kazuya quietly sat down beside her. She clearly had something on her mind, but instead of addressing it, she began to whistle, swinging her legs back and forth like a carefree child. La 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 dot. Can you try stating your point before I die of old age? Mila Rose cleared her throat and looked at him, her green eyes reflecting his vicious skull mask. Skull. Yes, I love you if you are thinking about confessing to me. Let us fly to church and put rings on each other. Please be serious for once. It's about my transformation. Mila started slow, her voice husky with emotions, and her heart rate hiking. Everyone's riatsu was fluctuating wildly when it happened. But you, you didn't show a single change. Why was that? His apparent indifference to her life and death struggle made her uncomfortable. Despite their recent conflicts, she had hoped that he would show some concern after they had resolved their misunderstandings. She was willing to risk her life to protect him and Haribel. A minor concern in return was nothing much. Kazuya tilted his head back, his gaze settling on the silvery moon above. I had unwavering faith that you would succeed. Mila Rose had no idea that he had known her long before their first encounter in Hueco Mundo, that he had recognized her potential as an errand car from the start. Somehow, she felt her cheeks becoming hot. Where the hell did that trust come from? He chuckled, his eyes twinkling with mischief. Can you explain every emotion and thought that courses through your mind? No, right? Some things simply exist without explanation or for reasons beyond our understanding. Oh! I. He leaned in, gently cradling her chin in his hand. In an instant, his mask vanished, revealing his human form beneath. The instantaneous transformation happened at his will. After a lengthy first time, he could switch between both races at will without even opening the race editor. Rose. Why, yeah. Their close proximity and his sweet, whispery voice clouded her thoughts, causing her to stammer. Instead of questioning me, shouldn't you reward me for helping you? Yeah, you're right. So let me, he whispered, drawing nearer until their lips hovered a hair's breadth apart. Embrace you. Mila Rose closed her eyes, allowing herself to be swept up in the moment's intensity. Their breath mingled as their lips met in a sweet, innocent kiss. Chapter 28 Care Crackle A vicious surge in Riatsu brought the kiss to a premature end. Mila Rose snapped to her senses and pushed his face away from her. W what the hell was I doing? She kissed Kazuya, a lewd act she never imagined herself doing with someone else, much less a man. Kazuya didn't dwell on Mila Rose's distress. 
Instead, he swept his riatsu over the area, searching for the terrifying yet familiar presence that had interrupted their moment. He located the source of the familiar riatsu, well concealed and undetectable to those not diligently searching. He glanced over his shoulder. Haribel, you can come out. Haribel Sama is here? Haribel emerged from behind a boulder and approached them. She wedged herself between Mila Rose and Kazuya, pushing Mila Rose away from him in the process. You called? She acted like she wasn't eavesdropping and peeping at them from a hidden spot. Her calm and collected manner worked her in her favor this time around. Mila Rose just stared at Haribel, stupefied. Haribel Sama. Despite her resentment toward Haribel's interference, she respected her leader too much to question her suspicious actions. Haribel sighed. I'm sorry, Mila Rose. I had to check up on him. I didn't want you to get into a fight. Kazuya would be stupid to take Haribel's words at a face value. She might be peeping on her son for all he knew. I won't fight Rose. Heck, we were about to enter a new phase in our lovey-dovey relationship. Haribel responded with a shocked look, I see. I wasn't watching you. Oi, Skull. Stop spitting lies. Who the heck wants to? Kazuya leaned behind and winked at Mila Rose. You let me kiss you, that's a fact you can't deny. You are horribly twisting the facts. Mila Rose sprang to her feet and pointed at him with her sword. I didn't stop you because you mentioned something about rewarding you. Yeah, that's it. Think nothing more of it than a reward. She was too embarrassed to admit being attracted to Kazuya, knowing that the menace Sung Sun will rip her apart with teasing. Haribel closed her eyes and giggled, adoring the sight of her children messing around instead of fighting. It was one of the few times she had been so lively. Kazuya, I need a favor from you. Kazuya paused and looked into her eyes. Despite his deep understanding of her character, he could never guess the thoughts coursing through her mind. Sure. Haribel lowered her head, her eyes brimming with seriousness. Can you? All three suddenly spun their heads in one direction. A familiar riatsu was flaring up in the distance, as if it was preparing for a fight. Kazuya instantaneously slipped into his hollow form. Standing up and unfolding his wings, he showed a grim look. Apache is in trouble. I'm going ahead. With a burst of sonido, he gained momentum and tore through the air, leaving Mila Rose and Haribel behind as he raced toward the source of the disturbance. Kazuya found himself in the haunting battleground where he silenced Dordoni for eternity. A horde of monstrous Jillians unleashed torrential Ciro rays, painting the desolate landscape in vibrant crimson. A blood-soaked Apache nimbly dodged each lethal beam, her agility and determination evident as she lunged at a towering Minos Grande with every ounce of her strength. Yet the behemoth remained unfazed by her full-powered headbutt. The Minos Grande drew its colossal hands from its shadowy cloak and struck Apache with a resounding impact. She was sent hurtling into a nearby mountain, crumbling rocks cascading around her crumpled form. Exhausted, injured, and drained of Ryoku, Apache couldn't even block a Jillian's attack. She struggled to her feet with trembling legs, only to collapse once more. And not yet. Damn it, where are the others? I'm here. Kazuya arrived by her side, cradling her face as he transferred some Ryoku to her. Just rest. I'll take care of them. She looked at him, eyes overflowing with emotions. Why you are so late? Kazuya nodded solemnly, his focus shifting to the menacing Jillians. His riatsa bore down on them, a crushing force that made them shudder. With a swift motion of his hand, he unleashed oppression, reducing the creatures to grotesque chunks of flesh. Did they come for Dordoni's body? I didn't let them touch it. She seemed smug about putting her life in danger for a corpse. I'm glad you're not dead. He leaned his chin on her hollow mask and cleared the blood from her with his riatsu. Her tail adorably wiggled even while she refused to look at him. There, you are all clean now. Sung Sun approached the pair as Kazuya finished cleaning Apache, while Haribel and Mila assessed Apache's condition from afar and returned to base. 
Sung Sun cast a glance at the mangled remains of the Jillians, playfully nudging Kazuya with her tail. Era, am I interrupting your cuddle time? Apache shot Sung Sun a glare. I'm out of Ryoku at the moment. Kazuya is helping me clean. I'd also request Kazuya's cleaning services after I become an Erencar. They will be free for a friend, right? Absolutely free. You can bring another friend if you want. What a sweet gentleman. I'd bring my old friend Rose then. She will appreciate your services. After some light-hearted flirting, Sun Sun left Kazuya alone with Apache. It was for the best, as he needed to address her privately, away from prying eyes. Apache, I care more about you than that corpse over there. I'd be very sad if you became a corpse while protecting a corpse. You know, I can find Aaron Carr's corpse in Lost No Chase, but I can't find another Apache. His tender words had the intended effect, prompting Apache to stare at him wordlessly, touched by his sentiment. Oh, of course. There is only one Apache in this world, but there are thousands of Mila Rose. You won't find me anywhere. He chuckled at her budding envy, or perhaps jealousy, for Mila Rose. He playfully tugged at her ears, making her wince in pain. That's why you should stop risking your life for nonsensical reasons. It's not nonsensical. How is it not? You could have called me, Sun Sun, or even Sirachi. Fighting them in your condition was beyond reckless. You could have died if I didn't make it in time. His sharp voice contrasted with his usual gentle, honey tone. Apache felt as if time had frozen. She had been waiting for a reward for enduring an impossible battle for him. Yet, here he was, scolding her for her recklessness. For the first time, Apache experienced the biting sting of cold betrayal. Kazuya sighed and gently rubbed her horn. Look, I'm sorry for being so harsh and controlling, but I will do everything I can to protect you and others. He gestured Apache to Dordoni's corpse. You can eat him. Apache understood his reasoning, but it didn't ease her bitter feelings. No, you eat him to increase your Ryoku capacity. It'll be beneficial for you. You might break into Vasto Lord if you eat him. His enticing words made her pause and ponder, distracting her mind from his previous scolding. Vasto Lord, Apache whispered. Will I have a body like Haribel as a Vasto Lord? Andy dripped from each and every word as she imagined herself in a similar form as Haribel and most likely Mila Rose. Most likely. I. Don't hesitate. You risked your life to protect it. It belongs to you now. Apache glanced in Dordoni's direction and shook her head. Your strength is harder to increase than mine. I can eat any random hollow and gain little boost. She was being selfless for once, hoping he could feel her care behind her small sacrifice and stop being so harsh. She just wanted him to be the casual, playful Kazuya. Kazuya grinned. Geez, stop staring at me. I know I'm handsome and you love me, but get a human form before we take things further. W who loves you, Skullhead? Apache grumbled as she lowered her head, her heart pounding in her chest. Leave me alone. Well, eat to your heart's content, my adorable dear. He left Apache alone to enjoy her meal. She might reach Lord status or at least come close to achieving it. More crucially, it will heal her wounds faster and recover the lost Ryoku. Chapter 29 A Bloody Tale Apache trudged back into the shadowy cave, the weight of stress pressing her down. Her gloominess was well founded. She had devoured every bit of Dordoni, absorbing his flesh to enhance her Ryoku. Yet, despite her efforts, the Vasto Lord class remained a distant dream. A realm far away from her reach. Should I break my mask? She pondered, recalling the surge of power that such a simple act could unleash. But she knew, too, that great strength came with great risk. She was inextricably drawn to the possibility ever since witnessing the awe-inspiring might of Mila Rose. I promised Kazuya to be patient, but I also promised to become the strongest Erencar. While eager to fulfill her promise, she had no choice but to slow down. Her gaze fell upon Kazuya, who lay nestled against Cyan Sung Sun's giant snake form. 
Sun Sun's scale tail draped over him like a protective shield, yet he seemed to find comfort in its embrace, sleeping soundly beneath it as if it were a makeshift quilt. One could say he was having the time of life surrounded by cuddly pets. How dare he sleep with her after making that deal with me? Did he goad her into a deal? She seethed with jealousy. Sun Sun lifted her head and hissed. The deer triumphantly returns after devouring an eagle. Yet one could not see any signs of happiness on the deer's face. Are these the signs of tragedy to come? Apache growled at Sun Sun's unnecessary commentary of her actions. Fuck happiness. Kazuya stirred, sitting up and gesturing for Apache to join him. Come here. She complied, sinking down and resting her head on his legs, using his thighs as her cushion. It's my turn to use you. Use my body as much as you want, he murmured, a gentle smile gracing his lips. My dear dear, what's weighing on your heart? Kazuya could sense the storm raging within her, as well as her desperate yearning for strength to fill the void in her soul. Sun Sun's words about the tragedy had not been entirely off the mark, Apache might very well attempt something reckless in her quest for power. Her hollow hole was more than proof of her lust for raw power. Apache gritted her teeth. I am angry at myself. I just want to become strong and kick Berrigan's ass with you. But I can't even get close to Espada with my current strength. This makes me so mad. Kazuya listened intently to her impassioned outburst, his fingers gently stroking her head. Almost involuntarily, she leaned into his tender touch, finding comfort in his caress. Then stopped dwelling on it, Sun Sun advised, her voice cool and collected. Only fools focus solely on surpassing their adversary's strength. Why not try outwitting your opponent instead? Like Kazuya and his plan for the living world. Running away to a faraway place isn't a smart strategy. Then fighting your opponent against stacked odds is smart? Sun Sun scoffed. Don't make me laugh, Apache. I want to fight with everyone as much as you. You have to cultivate patience, or you'll end up as someone's food. Apache's teeth clenched in frustration. She had been using the flea and hide technique for years. However, in the present time, she couldn't shake off the urge to gain more strength, as if her hunger had expanded upon consuming Dordoni. Slow it down, ladies, Kazuya interjected, hoping to defuse the escalating tension between Apache and Sung Sun, Apache, please. With a resigned sigh, Apache rested her head on his thigh once more. I'm sorry, Sun Sun. I shouldn't have acted mean. Era, friends needn't apologize to one another. If you truly wish to express your gratitude, promise not to die before me. There's nothing more heart-wrenching than losing a friend. A heavy silence settled upon the group as Sung Sun's words, tinged with sorrow, hung in the air. No one had anticipated such vulnerability from the typically sharp-tongued and sarcastic Sung Sun. Then again, she had been preaching the importance of survival to Kazuya for some time now. He tenderly brushed his fingers across her scales. I promise to keep everyone alive, even our watcher kitten out there. For the last time, stop calling me kitten. Mila Rose's yell made the group laugh. Haribel, who was sitting quietly in a corner, cast a warm gaze at the three. She closed her eyes again, returning to the warm yet cold embrace of her nightmares. Kazuya, I have been curious. How do you think an Ajuchas becomes Vasto Lord? I am not sure, but it has something to do with raising our Ryurioka level and subduing our wild instincts. Subduing our wild instincts? Apache whispered. I am not following your words here. And how come you remember so many things despite your amnesia? They're like instinct. Haribel, you remember how you became Vasto Lord? Apache glanced in Haribel's direction. The bronze skinned Vasto Lord leaned against the cave, recollecting distant memories. I don't remember. Sun Sun drew close to his ears. Haribel Sama paused. That means she is lying. He raised a brow. Hey! Haribel. Sun Sun said you're lying. Traitor! Sun Sun retorted. You sold me out. I-I trusted you. Never trust a guy with a skull mask, 
he whispered with a grin. Besides, it's a small price to learn more about our caring leader. You act more like a leader than Haribel, Apache muttered under her breath. Cocky Skull Demon Haribel wordlessly gazed at everyone, studying and calculating something with little emotion in her eyes. Kazuya turned to his human form and smiled, feigning innocence and cheerfulness one would expect from a child. Haribel, it's fine if you don't want to share your story. I'll bring it up when I do something to truly earn your trust. Sometimes life leaves you with no choice but to gaslight your crush into revealing the truth. Haribel melted seeing his hurt expression. There was simply no way for her to resist spoiling him. It's nothing special. Are you sure you want to waste time with this? Kazuya's expression brightened. I have nothing else to do until Surechi recovers. May as well listen to your bedtime story. Most vast, O oh Lord, I know became one after consuming endless souls, but I didn't. My evolution happened when I saw mindless violence and bloodshed. Tracing her sword arm on the wall, she revealed the secret nobody knew. A village of normal hollows was desecrated by one cruel vast, O oh Lord. A demon with four sword arms massacred the hollows before my eyes, and I was too weak to stop the demon. I wanted to defeat him even if I had to die fighting him. My irrepressible anger became the fuel of my evolution. Kazuya's mind raced as he felt a flicker of recognition upon hearing Haribel's tale. What are the odds it's Neutra? While other hollows might share similar physical traits, the likelihood of encountering a Vasto Lord with four arms was next to impossible. She became Vasto Lord because of sacrifice, he whispered. It seemed as if Haribel's evolution relied heavily on her desire to sacrifice her aspect of death. One's indulgence in their aspect of death, doing everything to fill one's hollow heart, might be the key to advancing to Vasto Lord from Ajuchas. Did you kill him or not? Haribel shook her head. When I was ready to deliver a decisive blow, it used its rest of energy to flee. I haven't encountered it since. The demon is still out there terrorizing hollows? Apache asked in shock. Kazuya, you better slaughter that asshole. Don't let it flee. I will not fail, madam. I am not the strongest, but I can tweak my body to fly faster than a jet. Haribel nodded. That coward preys on weak hollows. He'll be no match for you. Chapter 30 Hatred for Men as the group settled into a comfortable silence, Kazuya called forth his status. General Information Name, Kazuya Ishihara Gender, Male Race, Human Ryurioka Level, Great Level, Captain Class Alignment, Neutral Evil Affiliation, None Racial Abilities None Innate Abilities Silvery Voice Crumbling heart, human you can walk unhindered upon any surface. Regeneration. Pain resistance. Acquired abilities. Seduction, the ability to seduce those of the opposite gender. Mastery level basic. Riding, the ability to ride a mount. Mastery level intermediate. Arithmetic, the ability to process arithmetic problems. Mastery level intermediate. Provocation, the ability to anger people with your tongue. Mastery level, basic. His crumbling heart ability had changed along with his race. Instead of providing support to allies, it had transformed into a self-serving skill that was absurdly underwhelming. After all, he could easily create Ryurioku platforms to fly anywhere. What was the point of this innate ability? Can't have all the good things. Well, Surachi won't recover for a while. Should I train in my human form? He shook off the idea. The only potential evolution for his human race was becoming a Quincy. Normal Quincy's weapons and techniques were nothing extraordinary. Scrift, the greatest ability of the Quincy race was gatelocked by Yawatch, the father of Quincy's. Blood is the most useful. I'll focus on my hollow powers first. Who knows if I can unlock a form beyond Vastolord? He was already so far in his hollow evolution. He might need to train for years to achieve comparable power with human and Shinigami forms. 
they would merely be side quests compared to the priority of his hollow form. After all, he wasn't confident about achieving Bankai in ten days, like Ichigo. Fighting a captain class without Bankai would be tough. First priority hollow, second Shinigami, and last Quincy. Leading his cave, he found Mila Rose perched atop a mountain. She vigilantly scanned the surroundings for any threats encroaching upon them. He soared above her and playfully launched a tiny Ryurioku orb at her head. Hello, my sweet kitten. Mila Rose snarled, eliciting a chuckle from him. He zipped away, soon pursued by an irritated Mila Rose. Landing on the ground, he turned to face her. Want a train? Mila Rose's grumpy expression transformed into one of excitement. Casting aside her shirt, she took on the stance of a predator ready to pounce upon its prey. Dordoni's nonsense didn't let me show my full potential. Devour. Leona! Gold Lioness General. Her resurrection form was unleashed with a torrent of Riatsu. It was just as eye-catchingly feral and seductive as he remembered. She set her green eyes on him. Kazuya, I'm coming. Try not to become a flat corpse. Dordoni hadn't provided her with a proper opportunity to display her physical prowess. Kazuya became the ideal contender for her to unleash her full force. He fortified his arms with oppression and released his Ryurioku to augment his defenses with Riatsu. Mila Rose closed the gap in a split second and swung her broadsword. Get wrecked! He tilted his head, narrowly evading the immense arc of her blade, and drove his knee towards her belly. He forced her to face him in a range where her weapon was hard to use. She countered by swiftly raising her knee to intercept his strike, then launched a vicious elbow towards his face. He deftly ducked beneath her assault, snaked an arm between her legs, and hoisted her onto his shoulder with surprising agility. Mila Rose writhed on his shoulders, pounding the hilt of her weapon into his ribs and battering him with her knees. W what the heck are you planning? Grimacing through the pain, he found a firm grip on the back of her neck and flung her skyward. She slammed into the ground, sending plumes of white sand exploding in every direction. She was buried a couple of inches under the Hueco Mundo. You bastard! She leaped out, fuming with rage at being tossed about like a sack of potatoes. Why you're despicable. How can you treat a woman like that? Everything is fair in love and war. I approach every battle as if it's war, and I also love you. So everything I do here is fair. Mila Rose stared at him, stupefied. You love me? When the hell did that happen? Aside from their kiss and some moments, their relationship bordered on the verge of acquaintance and friend, leaning into the latter after their kiss. Suddenly hearing him confess his love shook her mind. He lunged at her with his fist. She blocked his punch with her broadsword and pushed him back. Focus on training first. Don't get distracted. Don't ignore my question, damn it. What the hell did I do to earn your love? I don't know. You being sexy might have something to do with it. So you're just after my body. Mila Rose's face turned dark as though she hated the thought of being lusted after for her body alone. Golden Riatsu crackled around her as a tidal wave of murderous intent bore down on Kazuya. All men are the same. I thought you were different. In the end, you're like everyone else. He was certainly wrong about curing her hatred for men in one conversation. It would take time to cure her prejudice. Before he could ease the misunderstanding, Mila Rose charged at him with the ferocity of a lioness, slashing at his chest. Her attacks were lethal, aimed to kill. He enveloped his hand in Riatsu and caught her Zampakudo with his bare hands. Her Riatsu sliced through his skin like a hot knife through butter, but her blade failed to penetrate his flesh. The sight of his blood poured cold water on her impulsive fury. She retracted her Zampakudo, her gaze fixed on his rapidly healing wound. While she regretted injuring Kazuya, he was of a different mind. Will my hollow mask regenerate if it's broken? He decided to test the theory later. Rose, I didn't mean it that way. Don't try to murder your man over a misunderstanding, dude. What else did you mean by those words? You completely ignored the might part. 
your body is just one part of my love equation. I am still trying to figure out the other part. He hadn't completely fallen for her, but he absolutely adored her. Mila Rose sighed, her shoulders sagging. She raked a hand through her hair, hoping her impulsive words hadn't wounded him. Something went off in my head when you said that. I'm sorry. You heard me. It was emotional damage. Is that so? She let her Zampakudo fall to the ground and encircled his waist with her arms, seemingly attempting to crush him in her embrace. Forgive me, or I'll crush you with my bare huong. Boy, stop. It's starting to hurt. He hadn't strengthened his waist with oppression, focusing on his limbs to increase his explosiveness. Mila Rose's hug genuinely squeezed the life out of him. Just say the damn words. Okay. I forgive you. Stop it now. Mila Rose laughed and tightened her grip before hoisting him off the ground and twirling him around. She set him down after a dozen dizzying spins and laid a hand on his shoulder. You brute. She continued laughing. Oh my god. Kazuya, I don't hate whatever we have right now. Let's, you know, defeat Berrigan first then sort the rest of this stuff. I want to focus on training and becoming stronger. I see. She stepped back and placed her hands on her hips, drawing eyes to her ABS. What am I saying is? That you love me and you can't live without me, but Berrigan is a bitch who won't let you sleep peacefully. So, we got to take care of him first. You got nothing. Kazuya chuckled before dodging a broadsword strike. They continued training with an intense, pulse-pounding battle. He found it increasingly difficult to counter her devastating blows. She exhibited far greater brute strength and agility than in her clash with Dordoni. Had she grown stronger within hours, or had she been holding back during her previous battle? It had to be the former, since she was still adapting to her new Erencar form. Was she this strong in the story? I don't believe it. Mila Rose had a blast swinging her sword all over the place. She fought him to her heart's content until her Ryurioku couldn't support her release form. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in part two. Peace.